Good morning and welcome everyone to the May 7, 2020 meeting of the Kentucky Board of Education. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Before we have a roll call, I have a few quick announcements. First, welcome back to everyone, all those present uh, in the session today, as well as those who will be viewing our work remotely. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to my colleagues on the board, it is a delight to see your Brady Bunch squares this morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're back. I also wanted to mention a uh, special thanks to Senator David Karam for his second term, second stint on the Kentucky Board of Education. Uh, I miss him already. I know we all do. And I just want to offer a special thank you uh, to David, if by chance he's listening to, to us this morning, for um, the service. When we needed him the most, he stepped up and he was here to support our work. So thank you, and we will miss you. Um, I also heard happy birthday was uh, wishes in order for Lee Todd, and you might not know, but over the last week or so for Ke for our own interim commissioner, Kevin Brown. So a lot of things happening there. Most importantly this week, though, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, and um, this is our chance as a board just for a moment to pause and think about the amazing work that Kentucky public educators have been engaged in over the last couple of months. Everybody says unprecedented about everything, but it truly has been a season that we will never forget. And, and um, our teachers have been remarkably resilient. They, as always, they are selfless, they're focused on their students. And um, I think families across the Commonwealth and certainly across the nation appreciate you more than they've ever perhaps expressed in the past. And so I just want to share on behalf of my colleagues on the Kentucky Board of Education, thank you. Um, Teacher Appreciation Week is a small token of our appreciation for the amazing work that you do. And um, we hope that you finish this year strong, strange but strong, and we thank you for all the work that you're doing. I also want to shout out to the staff of the Department of uh, Kentucky Department of Education Office of Ed Tech, and especially our, our dear Joette Fields for um, assisting members with their technology needs this morning. We know these aren't uh, smooth or perfect meetings, but we do feel like we're able to get the job done thanks to the support that we get from Andy and Megan and the entire team, and certainly from our direct assistance from Joette. We appreciate you so much. Um, I also have just a couple of brief announcements uh, about conducting the virtual meetings as a reminder to um, our members, our participants, and those who are in our audience. The meeting still must comply with the requirements of the Open Meeting Act. Accordingly, the Kentucky Board of Education members must ensure, please, that your video is streaming and you can be seen throughout the duration of the meeting. Members, please mute your microphones when not talking. However, all discussions must be broadcast to the public. Therefore, be sure your microphone is not on mute when you speak. Tough habit to get into, but I think we're all getting used to it, right? Uh, every time you speak during the meeting, please unmute your mic, state your name, and take a short pause. This will give the software time to recognize you. And we love jo Joanne Adams because she models the way for us as the first um, member of the alphabet on the roll call. Thank you, Joanne. And for any items that require a vote, a roll call vote will be necessary in this setting to record the vote of each member. At that time, the member should state his or her name, pause, and then state, I vote and then your response. Lastly, uh, members, if you would silence or turn off other electronic devices that may cause disruption to your sound feed. I think I've covered those housekeeping details. It is a pleasure to see you this morning and excited to get this business underway. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer and ask her for this morning's roll call, please. Absolutely, good morning, everyone. Joanne Adams. Joanne Adams. I am present. See, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Claire Bat. Claire Bat. I am present. Holly Bloodworth. Holly Bloodworth. I am present. Mike Bowling. Mike Bowling. 
I'm present. Alvis Johnson. Alvis, you may be muted. Let's see. Yeah. Alvis Johnson. I am present. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Patrice McCrary. Patrice McCrary. I am present. Good morning. Cody Polly Johnson. Cody Polly Johnson. Good morning. I'm present. Sharon Porter Robinson. Sharon Porter Robinson. I am present. Lee Todd. Lee Todd. I am present. And Lou Young. Good morning. This is Lou Young and I am present. Excellent. Chair, you have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you again for being here. The first item on our agenda is an overview of the commissioner search from our partners from Greenwood, Asher and Associates. Uh, so ladies, if you would um, like to go ahead, we um, will be sharing the commissioner search process <laughs> and providing them expectations, dates and details, as well as answering any questions that members may have. Good morning, Chair Young. Uh, my name is Suzanne Griffin. I'm from Greenwood Asher. I have two colleagues with me again today, Dr. Betty Asher and Dr. Ann Bailey. Um, uh, Chair Young, uh, Interim Commissioner Brown, board members, we are thrilled to be with you today. Uh, I do wanna take just a moment, if you'll indulge me and give a shout out to the teachers of Kentucky. Um, during Teacher Appreciation Week, um, and also to the administrators and support staff who are really embracing the opportunities um, and, and facing the challenges uh, with both positivity and professionalism during this really unprecedented time in education. Um, we have to also acknowledge the families and students who continue to prioritize a new kind of learning uh, with both commitment and creativity. Um, and then also for, for all of us who are connected to education, who are experiencing in a really new way what learning feels like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I just, I, you know, when I think about uh, my experience in education and how different it is today from that and how uh, as we move forward, we're going to need leaders who are truly uh, visionary um, and creative um, and bold. Uh, this is uh, your search for a commissioner is really very timely. Um, I'm just going to talk you through briefly what we hope to accomplish today um, and then just ask you uh, what else would need to happen um, at this meeting for you to feel as though it was a real success. Uh, we are going to provide you with an update on the work that we've done so far so that you're aware of what has been done on your behalf already. Uh, we will go through the search process and review each of the meetings that we'll be holding with the board and what we hope to accomplish at those meetings. Um, we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about how you can help us and how people who might be watching can help us identify people who they think would be a strong match for this position and how they can let us know who those individuals are and nominate them potentially for the position. And then we'll gather um, any additional thoughts you may have <clears throat> after you have had a little time to think um, about uh, what you may be looking for in a commissioner. If we were to accomplish all that today, uh, what else would need to happen at this meeting for you all to feel it was a success? Anything in addition? I would invite the board members, if anyone has any feedback for Suzanne this morning, just unmute and share that with her if you want to guide um, any additional direction for the conversation. This is, this is teacher wait time. <laughs> uh, Patrice McCrary. Would it be okay if we just asked along the way 
because I feel like you might be generating some opportunities for us to come up with some questions as you move along. I would encourage you to ask along the way. There's gonna be lots of information that will be shared. I expect that you'll have questions um, at the beginning or during the process, but you may also think back on something that we said earlier. Uh, and so we'll leave a little time at the end for you to ask questions as well. Excellent, I think that's good direction, Suzanne. So jump right in and thank you, Patrice. All right, thank you, Patrice. Um, hearing no other questions, we'll move forward and let you ask questions during the process. Uh, I'm going to kick this off now to Ann Bailey, Dr. Ann Bailey, and she's gonna give you a quick update on what we have done so far. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Bailey with Greenwood Asher. Uh, so far, we have worked with you to craft an ad and also a position profile document. Uh, we have begun posting that ad uh, in both online and print versions at a variety of outlets uh, that you have shared with us. Uh, we have also put together a position profile document. This document is about 10 pages long. It is what we call a marketing piece. It gives us an opportunity to showcase uh, your state, to provide information about uh, your organization and also about the position itself. It also includes the characteristics uh, that the board indicated would be important for the next commissioner. And we take that document and we begin to share that uh, throughout the market with prospects and sources and give everyone an opportunity to become, become familiar with uh, the opportunity. And if you look at the very last page of the document, uh, it will give you some information about how to make a nomination and in particular about what consists of an application, uh, contact information for Betty, Asher, Suzanne Griffin, and myself uh, is on there. And an application consists of a cover letter uh, where the candidate is going to connect his or her skills uh, to what is asked for, along with a CV, resume document and then a confidential list of five references and uh, we will review that if you have a nomination uh, please feel free to email the name of that individual to betty suzanne or me uh, we will be delighted to reach out to that individual uh, we have spent the last week uh, reaching out to nominations we have received so far and uh, we'll continue to have calls with those individuals and begin to watch the pool uh, build. Uh, board members, we will give you access uh, about two weeks before we get back together to review the pool uh, so that you will have time to review the applications. Uh, I will call each of you. We will give you the link. We will give you a unique password and you will be able to go in and review all of the applications before we get back together uh, as a group. Uh, I'll be delighted to answer any questions anyone has about the process so far. Thank you, Ann. And for the board members, just a reminder that you can see all of the uh, documents that Ann just mentioned in the portal under item 3A, if there's any of those that you haven't yet seen or want to see more closely. Questions for Ann. This is Claire Bat. I just, I had a quick question. Um, in looking at the numbers of applicants that you're receiving at this point in the search, do you feel that we're getting a good number and um, quality applicants? Uh, it's still it's still early, and uh, at this point, m most of what we have received is what we call ad response uh, applications. Uh, the real recruiting is beginning now, and as we move closer to getting back to you in about a month, uh, the pool will build, and those individuals that we have recruited will be in there for you. But right now, it's primarily ad response. Well, board member Betts, one of the things that uh, often happens 
is uh, people take a little bit of time to look at the marketing materials. They take a little bit of time to talk to their family about the, the opportunity. Uh, they might uh, call us back with some questions that they may have. So we'll often see the pool build uh, a little bit slowly at the beginning and more rapidly towards uh, the period of time where we say we're, we're gonna be reviewing applications. That is very typical. Alvis Johnson. Uh, I, I guess I'm, my question is, uh, we going out and you having done this so many times, uh, you have an idea of where the the most qualified candidates ought to be. Are we are we approaching those candidates and encouraging them to come and take a look at our opportunity? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, we are. Betty, do you want to respond to that? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Betty Asher, of course, with the firm. And uh, yes, I am very comfortable that we will have touched base with probably every other commissioner in the country. We will have touched base with every other number two person in the commissioner's offices. We are talking with superintendents. We are talking with people from foundations. So we're looking at a whole variety of people to bring you the most diverse pool that we possibly can. Um, I know there's a question that I will get throughout the day, and that is how many applications can we anticipate? And that's a hard question to answer, but if we rely upon the statistics from our last two searches, I think we were in the average kind of range of about 50 or so. I think we had plus 50 for one and under 50 for another one. So it's just really hard to tell until we've had the kind of conversations that we need to have in order to build that candidate pool for you. I would venture to say that we'll probably be making four or 500 phone calls and having conversations before we are ready to give you access to the pool. So it's just high volume work that we do, but we're certainly reaching out to a whole variety of people. Thank you for your response. Patrice McCrary here. Um, we are certainly in unusual times right now. Um, and I, I'm quite certain that you all are trying to work around the obstacle of mm -hmm. stepping into a world where all educators, all educational leaders right now, they're neck deep in trying to work through, uh, the closing of school for the year and the restarting of school. How are you adjusting to that new challenge? You know, it's been interesting in terms of our outreach broadly. Because so many people are working at home, we have actually been able to reach them easier than we have in some of our previous searches, uh, which has been a little bit of a surprise to us, but it actually has been easier. That's good news. Thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, Sharon Robinson. I just wanted to follow up on that uh, previous question and just ask, are people tending to be interested in new opportunities or are they pretty much heads down trying to um, deal with their present responsibilities. It seems that this is a very different time to be offering a new challenge to folks who are, who've shown the ability to uh, step up to challenges. <laughs> Sharon, it is a combination of both. Mm -hmm. We certainly are talking with people who are feeling very loyal and very overwhelmed with their work and they're just not in a position to look at a new opportunity right now. But by the same token, we have so far generated a, quite, a great deal of interest as well. Yeah, and if I can just add, I, I, to build on what Betty has said, uh, it, 
it's a little bit different sort of uh, environment in the sense that everybody is dealing with the challenge. So uh, in cases where we have leaders who uh, might have a unique challenge in their, in their district or in their state, um, they may say, I just can't leave at this point in time. But most of our leaders are gonna be stepping into the exact same challenge that they're leaving. Uh, in the sense of having to figure out how to deal with uh, the after effects of the pandemic, as well as what may come uh, in the future. So I think uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, there is certainly some places where people just feel I can't transition right now, but many of them are saying, you know, this could be our new normal. And so uh, I need to continue to look at opportunities that may present themselves where I can use my skills uh, in a unique way. Mm -hmm. And, and Sharon, one other point I often make with candidates is, you know, timing is never precisely right when you look at a new opportunity. You know, there's always a new project that you would like to be able to complete. There's a, a, a daughter that you have in high school. So they just sort of have to assess all of that and decide whether or not they're going to, you know, take the risk and give you an opportunity to take a look at them. Hi, this is Lou Young, and um, I really appreciate this line of questioning and just want to remind the board of a conversation that we had at the last meeting, and that was that we are committed to not settling. Um, so as we really track these um, application data and um, trust in Betty and Suzanne and the team to know that we in fact have um, a better than viable, a really good pool of applicants. Um, we have um, that gracious commitment from Interim Commissioner Brown that he will not leave us high and dry, that he's in for the long haul until we're ready to move forward. And I will just say as one individual, that gives me great um, comfort to know that we are not in a position where we will rush to any decision um, that we'll, we cannot support or don't feel good about. Before we go on, this is Claire, Claire Bat. I'd, I'd just like to ask you one more question. Um, and I appreciate what Lou's just said about uh, Commissioner Brown being willing to stand in for us. But I, I do wonder how, in your marketing of this position, what do you see as um, being the most attractive feature of coming to Kentucky? for many of the people you are, you are approaching. Um, I, I just sort of would like to get a feel for what your, your marketing strategy is. Well, I can tell you that many of the people that we've spoken with either have some ties with Kentucky or they have recognize the work that has been done in Kentucky over the years. They also have some familiarity with your two previous uh, commissioners. And I think, you know, we'll more than likely have conversations with them to get a, get a sense of what it is like to work in the state and to work within the environment that we're in now. Um, and in, for others, it's just an opportunity to grow and to move up into a more complex uh, organizational structure. Uh, this kind of the normal career development that people decide to accept a new challenge and to do something that is more complex and broader. So they have the, all kinds of reasons for why, they, why they're why they looking. We really have not heard uh, anything incredibly negative about, you know, the environment or why it is not a good place to be so far. Now, <clears throat> again, you know, we've not had 400 conversations yet. Um, so we'll be able to give you a better feel for that, you know, in a couple of weeks. Uh, this this is Lee Todd. Um, one suggestion is that you might tell candidates when you do talk to them that they should tune in at five o'clock to see our present governor 
do his uh, presentation regarding uh, the situation we find ourselves in. I don't think there's any better advertisement for the change in our leadership at this state than watching his uh, display of intelligence, uh, emotional stability, apathy, and um, I think it'd be warming to the, some of the clients to see that we have a governor who really does what he believes in and does it exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. And Lee, we've certainly had those conversations with people also, but that is a great idea. We'll, we'll learn more about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everyone, are you ready for me to talk a little bit and walk us through what we can expect over the next couple of months? And yes, please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask any question as we're going through this. But what I'm going to do is walk us through basically the same process that we've used for the last two searchers when Pruitt and Holiday were selected. I think it's a pretty efficient process for you, and I can definitely assure you it works. For some of you, you will be very familiar with the process, but for others of you, it might be something new. So I, I do want you to feel very comfortable and, and stop me at any time if you want more information. Um, I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about each of our next meetings and what we're going to expect. Um, but please know that before each of those meetings, we will get you ready. If you have any questions or if there's a task to be done in preparation for that meeting, we're gonna give you plenty of time so that you will know exactly what to do. Um, as you know, based upon <clears throat> the planning work that we've already done, we are now into that heavy recruiting phase. Um, trying to seek those candidates for you who best match what it is you're looking for. So for the next two or three weeks, we're gonna be in a little bit of a silent phase with you. You're not gonna hear much from us, but I wanna assure you that this is the time when we are on the telephone talking with all of those people around the country, trying to get them interested in the opportunity. And what we're going to do in about two or three weeks, we will call each of you individually. And it, the purpose of that call will be to give you access to the application files. Now for each candidate, we're going to be asking for three documents. You know, the typical curriculum vitae, resume, whatever you wanna call it, a cover letter and just be prepared. You will see some good ones and you will see some bad ones. And we will be asking for a few references, uh, give you a feel for you know some of the people whom you may know if you look at their reference list, for example. Now we're not doing any reference calling at this time, but we're just simply asking for names. <clears throat> and as soon as we get through that, that is when your work begins. What we'll be asking you to do is to take a look at each of those applications and just figure out which of those candidates rise to the top for you. Um, we're going to give you also a sheet that if you want to take your notes on that looks at all of the traits and the dispositions that you worked out with our commissioner Will Hoyt a few weeks ago. And while you're not going to be able to check every box on that chart by any means, because some of those are hard to quantify, especially just from reading a particular resume, but I think it will give you a feel for how you feel, whether or not they meet that particular trait. Um, what I often recommend to uh, reviewers is that your goal is to try to identify those who rise to the top for you. And you might want to put them in a little, in what I call three buckets. You know, make yourself an A-list, meaning 
these are the candidates whom I think would best match as Kentucky's new commissioner. And then here is a B list. I really like these candidates also, but they may not necessarily rise to the top. And then here are some candidates whom you will absolutely have no interest in pursuing further. Um, but do your best review of all of the applications. And then in our next meeting, this is what we call the prospect review meeting, and we'll work with you in the format that is most comfortable with you. And we will at that time give you an opportunity to share anything that you want to know about any of those particular candidates. Um, we all come from our own perspectives and some of us are looking for one particular trait that will be a higher priority than somebody else's trait will be a lower priority. But we will collectively come together and give you an opportunity to comment on any candidate that you want to have a, a say about. And again, the goal of that meeting will be to continue to narrow the pool a little bit uh, further you're basically selecting people whom you want to have an interview with. Obviously, as we go through this process, if we get to the point that we are able to do the things in person, that's what we will do. But if not, we will continue our virtual work here with the candidates as well. Um, but ideally, you know, you're looking for anywhere from eight to 12, but it doesn't necessarily have to be within that range. You know, if you liked 15 of them, we could do an interview with 15. I do encourage you not to go below eight because as we go through searches, lots of times you, we will lose candidates because they will take another position or something will happen in their personal lives and they can no longer continue in a particular search. So we want to make sure that we've got a really good pool for you at the end. So again, at that meeting, we're trying to select people whom you want to interview, those who rise to the top for you. Betty, now, Betty, Betty, Betty this is Lou. I just I wanted just to make, make sure, sure that the board members do have that prospect meeting on their calendars for June 4th. Thank you. If we do this, we need to do it electronically. We will, we have a way to do some electronic polling for you also. So we will be able to make some really fast and efficient decisions. Many of those of you who have been in the classroom, you used clickers before. And so we'll use the electronic version of clickers in order for us to be able to do polling. And we'll quickly be able to decide upon that eight or 10 group that will rise to the top for you. Then also notice on that schedule, we have set aside two full days to conduct those interviews. They will be long days for you and they will be tiring days, but I really believe that you will enjoy an opportunity to have that conversation with a smaller group of people. Um, we will work with you at that particular time in order to decide up on what questions you want to pose to them as you know, we need to be asking all of the candidates the same questions uh, in the spirit of fairness. It doesn't mean you can't ask follow-up questions and et cetera, but we will work with you at that time to help you decide upon the questions that you want to pose to them. Um, coming out of those interviews, Again, we are continuing to narrow our pool to a smaller group. I will ask you, which of these candidates do you continue to have an interest in? Those are the candidates whom we will move to the whole vetting process. 
The vetting process is a very important phase of the search. We do what we call 360 degree referencing. By that time, the candidates know that they're a serious candidate. So they give us written permission to make reference calls and we ask them to revise their list so that we have three supervisors, we have three peers and we have three direct reports and we ask for permission to go off their list as well as on their list. So we will be calling, you know, maybe up to 15 people on each of the candidates whom you believe that you continue to have an interest in. Our next meeting, which is on your schedule, is what we call the reference feedback meeting, and that's where we're going to share with you everything that we have learned about the candidates. Uh, now, this is a really important meeting because it is the meeting then where you really are going to decide up on the candidates whom you are going to bring forward in a quasi public setting and you know maybe take them out to the restaurant for dinner have an opportunity to uh, invite their partners with them and before you do your final interview with those three or four candidates or two however many you select you will have an opportunity to get to know them in an informal kind of setting as well as a more formal setting the next day. Um, we'll generally kind of break you up, you know, into a really small group of people so you can have an intimate conversation over the dinner table. So I think seeing them with their partners in a social setting will be really important to you as well. And then you will do your final interviews and make your decisions. Um, so that is really the process. Now let me stop there and let me see which of these phases that you might have particular questions about. This is, this is Jeff. Jeff. Um, I have a question about the um, the candidate criteria, the academic credentials, leadership, and vision management support. What I'm not seeing, it's implied but not explicit, decision making. And I think that our recent experience with leadership and decision making, you know, hearing from all perspectives, but also what are the primary principles of decision making? What are the low bearing beams in the decision making process used by the candidate? That would be of interest to me. And um, if we ask it of one, well, it's, it's something I just want to mention so that it's in our thinking as an aspect of problem solving or delegation, or I just would like that explicitly to be something that we think about. Sharon, that is also a wonderful interview question as well. So as you're going through reading the resumes and as you think about what's really important to each of you, would you sort of set aside a question like that so that we can talk about it and make sure that it's a question that we pose during the interview phase? Don't forget that. Just again, just make your little notes on the side about this is really important thing I want to probe the candidate about. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions before Betty moves on? Great. Thanks for the process information. All right. And committee members, once again, I know you have a contact sheet that has all of our information on it. I want to encourage you to feel free to call or write 
to any of the three, we're your team, everything I know about your search, uh, my colleagues are gonna know as well, everything they know, I'm going to know. So reach out to us very comfortably at any hour of the day for any question that you might have. But I wanna leave you with one other thing that we kind of went over quickly, and that is uh, our position profile will be posted on your department's website. And of course, as I said, we will be sharing it broadly across the country and across Kentucky. So lots of people will have it, and in it, it tells them exactly how to go about the application and who to contact if they have a particular interest or if they want to make a nomination. And I know that many of you have people in mind also whom you think we ought to reach out to. So I want you to put your thinking caps on and make those recommendations to us as well. You know, you represent the state, you are involved at the national level in various organizations. Um, and as Chair Young reminded us earlier, don't set your sights low. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, I would love to have Mary Smith, but she would never come to Kentucky. Don't do that. Uh, send us Mary Smith's name and we take no easily. And as I said, 90% of the people we call say no to us, but sometimes we get those surprises. So don't set your sights low, but think about who you would like to have us reach out to and share those names with us. Any other questions at all that I can answer for you? Um, Ms. Ashley, I'll just chime to thank you and congratulate you. We have done a great job putting together, I think, uh, a great process. So if we can follow that process, I think we'll definitely get a quality candidate. So again, I appreciate the effort you all have put into that. All right. Well, thank you much. We're going to do our very best here to find you the best possible commissioner. So, Betty, I know we were going to ask um, for our team to share any direction about the commissioner search, but I don't want to rush you and your team. Is there anything else that you would like to share? I think we are good unless Suzanne or Anne has something else. I, I do want you to be aware I have a couple of things. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the confidentiality that's permitted to us uh, according to the law. But we do promise our candidates that, you know, their names will not be leaked until they become what we call a finalist, but one of those three or four people. And we also would like to ask you to make sure that, you know, we have kind of one spokesperson for the search and to let that be generally our, our chair here. It just gets messy if we all talk about where we are and what we're doing and that sort of thing. So if you get any official inquiries, please direct those to your chair as well. And we will work with her if she needs to. And the staff will work with her to to respond appropriately. Thank you. And you ladies will be around while we continue this discussion for a bit, right? You bet. Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> and I would like to invite Kevin and Todd to step in and um, join the conversation. I think we had some um points to make around communication as well as confidentiality. So Kevin, if I could, I'd like to turn it over to you. 
Yeah, and Todd, why don't you just go ahead and uh, give us the, the guidelines from a, the legal perspective uh, that was just mentioned by uh, Ms. Asher. Sure, good morning, everyone. Um, as Ms. Asher mentioned, um, it, Ensuring the confidentiality of applicants is obviously key um, to attracting the most uh, qualified applicants to the pool. There are individuals who um, will want to be assured that if they are not the ones who receive the job or are considered to be finalists, that um, their identity will not be made public that they applied um, for this position. So the Open Records Act actually gives us some flexibility. There are opinions that um, indicate that applicants uh, for positions of non-successful candidates, those are exempt from production under the Open Records Act. So if we were to receive a request for application materials from individuals who are ultimately not selected for the position, we would not make those public. We would not turn them over. Um, your board policies provide that the board chair is the spokesperson on behalf of the board. So we would encourage you that if you were to be contacted by anyone, whether it is the media um, or anyone else that you just refer those matters to uh, Dr. Young as the board chair and um, she can work with our communications staff, Tony Constatman and her staff to respond to any inquiries that we receive. Um, we do that again uh, in the interest of protecting the confidentiality of applicants who ultimately are not selected and that um, that level of confidentiality that Betty and her team are able to assure those applicants allows them to attract more individuals to the pool. And in addition, uh, uh, Tony, are you, if you're on, uh, we're going to also do a press release through the department, of course, using the, uh, the team we have here just to dovetail in with what Greenwood Asher is doing uh, in the various publications and just to utilize all of the uh, communication network networks and uh, organizations and um, all the leadership here in the state uh, has the same information at the same time. So we're probably going to oversaturate um, using both the efforts of the search firm as well as our communications team just to make sure we get all that information out. Yes, I'm, yeah, we're, I'm sorry. I was having an issue connecting there. I apologize. Uh, yes, we will be issuing a press release uh, today, and we will continue to uh, update the public and uh, continue to work with Dr. Young on all of the uh, communication as it relates to uh, the search process. And just as a housekeeping matter, um, Chair Young, uh, the MOA that I'm on for the interim commissioner is technically up on June 30, but um, we are taking uh, KDE staff working with JCPS staff to uh, get an extension of that. Uh, it looks like obviously that will be necessary. So, uh, and I've had conversation with Jefferson, the board chair and superintendent Polio to make sure they know that that is uh, on its way. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking those affirmative steps. We um, we do need you and um, whatever extension we need to engage in will be helpful as we move forward through the process. And, and thanks to Todd and Kevin and the whole team. Um, I hope the board can hear that it is our goal to be as transparent in this process as our um, uh, Commonwealth would expect. Um, but at the same time, we do have to be very sensitive to those kinds of constraints, especially as it relates to these candidates and their um, confidentiality. So it is in no way um, our um, goal to be anything less than transparent in the process, um, but we'll be really careful to fo follow uh, policy guidelines and Todd's advice as we move forward. Do any other board members have questions for Kevin, um, Todd, and or the Greenwood Asher team? This would be a good time to just unmute and jump in there. We want to make sure you feel like you have all of the front end information that you need as we move forward. All right, hearing none. 
All right, thank you so much to the board, um, to our partners from Greenwood Asher, and to our um, team in Commissioner Brown's office for the information. And thanks to the board members for the commitment that you're making to uh, of your personal time and expertise as we make this extremely important decision. And I did hear from Jennifer that Joette will be putting all of these dates on our um, KBE Outlook calendars so that you'll have all of this information ready. And um, I think that's everything we wanted to handle here. So ladies, thank you again so much. We appreciate your, um, your advice and direction and expertise. Look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right, the next item on our agenda, I'd like to turn over to um, Commissioner Brown regards waivers of uh, regulatory requirements in response to the COVID-19 emergency and lots of other information. So Kevin, if you would um, just drive this portion as you see fit, please. Sure, thank you, uh, Chair Young. Uh, as the board knows, the uh, State Board of Education has uh, statutory authority to waive regulations that the State Board uh, promulgates. And uh, that those are not, you don't have the authority to waive statutes, but you have the authority to waive your own regulations. And of course, that's how the State Board governs is uh, through the all the uh, regulations affecting in uh, local schools and districts. And because of the COVID-19 emergency, there are various um, things that have come up in our conversations with school districts on our, and on our various advisory calls and through the task force and, and just in day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with school districts that are somewhat our barriers and uh, to the uh, proceeding through the school year just because of the nature of the emergency. So you've already had several waivers you passed at the April meeting. We want to go ahead and get this these waivers in front of you in this meeting and not wait till June. I'll turn it over to Todd and um, uh, and uh, Dr. Foster and Dr. Ellis, I believe, to discuss the need for these waivers. Yes, good morning. So we have two uh, waivers that are before you, and there should be, I believe, two separate staff notes on your portal for you to review. We'll take the first one, which is related to minimum high school graduation requirements. Um, Dr. Ellis and other leaders at KDE have had frequent communication with school districts on graduation requirements in light of COVID-19. And um, most school districts are able to meet the state minimum high school graduation requirements that are set forth. However, we did receive two waivers um, from Fayette and Jefferson counties requesting a little bit of relief from the minimum high school graduation requirements. And in okay. essence, what they are requesting um, is that the state board waive the requirements for electives for a very limited population of students. Those are students uh, who are, yes. Just to clarify, was that Fayette and Jessamine? Fayette and Jessamine, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and they requested these waivers for the population of students who are in alternative programs who um, otherwise may not be able to meet the minimum high school graduation requirements. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ellis for her to discuss that a little bit further. Good morning. So just as Todd spoke, um, and you all know, we had the conversation um, with all of our school districts and advisories and superintendents, just encouraging them to look at their local um, requirements. And then also, um, if it was necessary for certain populations of students to not be able to fulfill the electives due to connectivity or accessibility, um, that is what we ask. And we did, as Todd mentioned, only had two requests, and that is for a very specific population of students. And one of them is for students who are uh, between the ages of 18 and 20, um, who are trying to complete their, who are seniors and complete their um, their requirements. And so um, that's basically what they had uh, requested. They were very thorough and, and asked lots of questions uh, to really understand what they were asking for a waiver and really considered all of their students' situations, which I appreciated. Um, but both um, were caused from the superintendent uh, webcast that uh, Kevin um, and all of our team host uh, pretty much almost every week, um, and as well as from the uh, principal advisory council. That's where uh, the questions stem from, but only the two um, were actually submitted. 
And Dr. Young, you will see in the uh, commissioner's recommendation section of the staff note, the waiver that is recommended by the commissioner, it's very limited. Um, we're recommending waiver of section 34H in your regulation for minimum high school graduation requirements. And that's the section that uh, sets forth the, what we call the elective requirements. And that is only for 12th grade students who are 12th graders as of March 6, 2020, and enrolled in a credit recovery or another alternative credit program. So this is a very limited and narrow waiver. Um, you'll see in the second paragraph there under the commissioner's recommendation that we're also recommending the board grant the commissioner the authority to grant the same waiver to other districts if they make that request by letter. So that if other districts run into this situation prior to graduation, Situation, they can make and receive that, uh, make the request for that waiver and receive it without the board having to come back and meet again. So Todd, I think two motions would be in order. The first regarding the specific waivers as you stipulated for Jessamine and Fayette, followed by a motion regarding the prospective and conditional waivers moving forward. But before I call for those motions, I'll just pause and ask the board members, please unmute if you have any questions um, for um, for General Counsel Allen, Commissioner Brown, or um, Associate Commissioner Ellis. Patrice McCrary here. Um, I'm curious to know approximately how many students does this affect at this point in time? Patrice, I, I am not exactly sure. I don't have the exact number. I know it was a very small population and specifically um, for those who are in the alternative um, credit, um, you know, programs. Um, and I know that, that that's why they were really looking at each population. And as Todd mentioned, they were already seniors. So this isn't like they were going back to freshmen and sophomores and saying, you don't have to do your electives. Um, and they do know that they have to complete, that they had to complete the uh, core credits with English language arts, mathematics, science, social studies, um, visual performing arts, PE and health. So all those are still fulfilled. It would just be those seven additional electives. So I'm not exactly sure of the number. Todd, do you have that in front of you? Because I, I did not pull that for this. I apologize. We can get that to you though. No, the number isn't included on the applications by the school districts. In the application from um, Jessamine County, they state that it will be, they ensure it is a small percentage of their student population, but they do not provide us with a number. Other questions? Dr. Young, hearing on, I knew that we uh, got the waiver of 34H after having reviewed the documents uh, and subsequently got the commissioner the authority uh, to waive any additional requests that might come from the state. Alvis Johnson. Thank you. We have a on the floor from Alvis. Do we have a second? This is I Lee second Todd, I it. Think. Yeah. Mike Bowling. I think I have a second from Lee um, and a third from Mike. Thank you. Any discussion, any further discussion before we call for a roll call vote? Thank you. Hearing none, Jennifer, if you would please call the roll. Absolutely. And as a reminder, don't forget to state your name and then pause. Joanne Adams. Joanne Adams. I vote yes. Claire Batt. Claire Batt. I vote yes. Holly Bloodworth. Oh, <clears throat> Holly Bloodworth. I vote yes. Mike. Bowling. Mike, you may be muted. Okay, we'll move on. Alvis Johnson.
Albus? Albus Johnson. Yeah. I vote yes. Patrice McCrary. Patrice McCrary. I vote yes. Cody Polly Johnson. Cody Polly Johnson, I vote yes. Sharon Porter Robinson. Sharon Porter Robinson, I vote yes. Lee Todd. Lee Todd, I vote yes. And Lou Young. This is Lou Young, and I vote yes. Great, thank you, Chair. Thank you. And um, and then regarding 704 KAR7 colon 160, uh, Todd, Kevin. Yes, so this waiver was not requested by a specific school district, but it was identified by program staff as one um, that may need to be waived given the fact that schools are closed in person classes and significant amounts of staff are not reporting um, physically into school buildings. 704 KAR 7160 is the state board's regulation around the use of physical restraint and seclusion in public schools. And part of that regulation requires a core team of school employees to be trained on an annual basis on how to properly restrain a student um, who may need that restraint. I will turn it over to Dr. Foster to discuss um, the requirements more specifically around training and how this was identified for waiver. Good morning. Um, I think Todd uh, did a great job of summing that up. This waiver request is just through June of 2021. And part of the restraint and seclusion training is the face-to-face -face training where they're actually learning how to restrain a child. And so um, due to the situation with COVID-19, it is not safe to have that part um, as the training. So we are asking for a waiver for people who have already completed everything else in the training since January 1 of 2019 successfully. So just keep in mind, this would just be a waiver of the face-to-face -face part of the training through June 30th, 2021. And the program staff in my office just felt like this is something that we needed to um, recommend to you all, considering the situation that, we will, they, that we're currently in, and this would provide some relief to districts. And just as a note, the board promulgated this regulation, obviously, for the health and safety of students who are in schools. Um, there are limited circumstances when a, a child cannot be de-escalated. The, the restraint and seclusion regulation provides that before restraint is utilized, um, that positive behavior intervention be used where appropriate to try to de-escalate the student prior to restraint. I will also note that the face-to-face um, -face training the hands-on training that Kelly is talking about is only being recommended for waiver for school staff who have had that in previous years so that no school staff would be performing a hands-on restraint um, having not previously had the hands-on face-to-face training in the past. This just waives the requirement for them to be retrained um, hands-on and face-to-face -face for this year. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes. Having said that, Elvis Johnson, having said that, no new staff that will be hired, should we be able to go back physically to the school, would be able to perform uh, uh, this restraint. Is that correct? I think you asked if new staff were hired, would be able to provide the restraint. So, no, if you have not received um, the training, new staff would not be able, if we go back to school with face-to-face -face classes at some point for the 2021 uh, school year, new staff would not be able to um, participate or actually, you know, serve as someone who is able to do the restraint there at the school. They would not be able to do that because they've not received the full training. I would just add that we'll, we obviously will continue, as we get close to the um, beginning of next school year, we will 
we're in constant contact anyway with the Department of Public Health and the governor's office. And of course, as um, we have the healthy at work and we continue on and, you know, we will have a healthy at school plan. Uh, there may be situations due to the public health uh, uh, requirements may ease up a little bit to permit some types of one-on-one -on -one training or uh, that, that type of thing. And so we're going to be, be monitoring that. And so, so to the extent that trainings could continue, uh, if social distancing is eased in a work or school environment for staff, then of course we're going to be communicating that to districts uh, so that they can get that training when it's safe to do so. Um, this is Allison Sloan. Um, as a teacher of students with special needs, um, especially emotional and behavior disorders, I am trained in the restraints and have been for several years. So thinking about uh, the safety of people going through training as we move forward and going back to school, possibly face-to-face -face school, I think this is something that we'll have to consider um, in those discussions of how school will look for those students that um, have previously needed restraints because of harming themselves or others. Um, we know we don't like to use those unless absolutely necessary, but that's something we may want to consider also when looking at being back face to face in the classroom is just the safety of those students and the teachers that would be required to use those restraints. Agreed. Thank you. Allison and Alvis, are there other questions um, before I entertain a motion um, to prospectively and conditionally waive section six, subsection three C of KAR seven colon one six zero? Hearing none, do we have such a motion? Joanne Adams, I so move. Thank you. We have a motion from Joanne and a second. Sharon Porter Robinson, I second the motion. And a second from Sharon Robinson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Jennifer, if you would please um, call the roll. Joanne Adams. Joanne Adams, my vote is yes. Claire Batt. Claire Batt, I vote yes. Holly Bloodworth. Holly Bloodworth, I vote yes. Mike Bowling. Uh, Mike Bowling, uh, I vote yes. And I don't know whether you, you, you got my vote in the last motion uh, because my computer cut out for just a minute or so, but I want to record that I voted yes then also, okay? Thank you, Mike. Alvis Johnson. Alvis Johnson. I vote yes. Patrice McCrary. Patrice McCrary. My vote is yes. Cody Polly Johnson. Cody Polly Johnson, I vote yes. Sharon Porter Robinson. Sharon Porter Robinson, I vote yes. Lee Todd. Lee Todd, I vote yes. And Lou Young. This is Lou Young, and I vote yes. Excellent, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, everyone. You guys are doing a great job with the time delay. Um, and speaking of time, um, we are doing really well uh, on our agenda as slated today. So I would like to take a very brief recess um, for your comfort. If we could take a 10 minute recess, please, um, and then reconvene at 1020 Eastern time. Feel free to turn off your video and mute.
Thank you, Megan. Um, we are returning from recess at 1020. And at this point, the remainder of our agenda will um, be led by Commissioner Brown and his team focusing on um, response to COVID-19 regarding strategic planning, budget, and any other information that they hope to share. So Commissioner Brown, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are, we wanted to give you a little bit of an update. At this meeting, of course, we'll have more details in the June meeting on it, similar to what we did in the April meeting, office by office. I think that's important to do again, but in the interest of time uh, today, we thought we, we just want to give you an update from a project management perspective and also a communications perspective. We are running the COVID-19 operation through project management, which means we have deliverables, which means we have interagency uh, uh, conversations and uh, it's just the uh, obviously the the best way to do it from a systems approach and uh, uh, Karen Dodd is our chief performance officer and uh, she's leading that effort it's going very well uh, before I turn it over to Karen though I do want to reiterate something that I've been saying as I'm speaking to various groups I know this is the board already knows this but um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal on March 28th that I keep talking about uh, that talks about the um, uh, that many schools and districts around the country have uh, ended the year early, and because remote instruction and the, uh, actually the headline in the Wall Street Journal Journal said because remote instruction was too tough, and I just that should not be lost on us because uh, Kentucky and there are other states that are continuing on, but we are not one of the states that. Uh, we recognize it's tough, but it wasn't too tough for us to tackle through a, a non-traditional instruction. And with knowing that non-traditional instruction is not perfect um, and it wasn't designed for this, but um, I'm really proud of the state and the teachers, the school districts, the boards, the superintendents to a person that we have had no complaints when we made this decision and when the governor made the final decision to that we just was not possible to return to in-person classes this school year. Of course, we heard a lot of feedback before that happened and we needed that type of back and forth. But once that decision was made and that recommendation was made, there I have received no complaints from schools and districts and we know that they are exhausted. And what that means is in Kentucky, we're going to have the equivalent of a minimal minimum instructional year of 1,062 hours. And yes, there's some there's a little bit of, of uh, we have some grace built into that because uh, we're allowing an NTI day to count for seven hours as it does in some districts, but not all districts. And of course, we're talking about competency based instruction in most cases. And um, it, it, and it's not a comparison to in-person classes. And, and so that allowed some districts to shave a few days off their calendar. But the point is, in Kentucky, we decided to continue on with a minimum minimum instructional year using the best <clears throat> platform that we have, and that's NTI. <clears throat> and I think our kids are going to be better for it. And uh, I just want uh, wanted to state that again publicly. I've said it to various other groups and want to make sure the board is aware of that. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, we're now past, we're somewhat, that, that I consider the getting districts through the NTI phase. Uh, we've offered a lot of guidance on graduation and end of year close out. How, how do you bring a child to school to clean out their locker, et cetera? And we've been working with public health. That's kind of phase one. And we're pretty much through phase one as far as offering that guidance. Districts are, of course, have not yet concluded their years or some of them haven't. Uh, Jefferson, of course, and I think Fayette will be going through and some others the end of the last week of May. So they're still in that. But as far as our guidance of the department, we're now on to phase two, and that's what Karen's going to talk about. And phase two being uh, offering guidance and assistance to school districts for the provision, the continued provision of summer feeding over the summer and what that looks like. And then also how can districts, um, to the extent that they have the capability, the bandwidth, the personnel, and the resources can offer uh, enrichment, accelerated learning, and other opportunities for students over the summer. And of course, um, using summer feeding as a uh, potential way to deliver that. And then of course, the big issue being, uh, how do we restart school um, in the fall as part of phase two? And you may have heard the governor press conference 
um, uh, and, and reference this. I got a call from the governor and lieutenant governor um, a few days ago. All the days run together. It was this week. I can remember that. And um, in the, they have been so great with the communication and giving us heads up about what we need to be thinking about. And so I, I talked to the superintendents that day. I guess that was on Tuesday. Uh, on a webcast, and we are advising superintendents that in school districts that you need to be planning for various scenarios in the fall. Uh, we know you need to be planning. We don't know exactly what you need to be planning for because the um, the environment we will be in in the late summer and fall with the virus is unknown. Of course, there are projections, and you've heard talk. Or could, there could be spikes here and there, and you can just turn on news and and hear that information. So. The governor's message and lieutenant governors, we need to be prepared. And so we're delivering that message to districts. And so uh, you're going to be hearing us. Uh, we won't get into a lot of detail about that today, but um, we're, we're guiding districts to begin thinking about an, uh, various calendar scenarios. So an early calendar. So starting the school year very early, having that as a possibility, meaning late July or early, very early August. And what that would do is allow districts to get days in person in classes uh, before there might be a fall spike in cases where they would have to go back to an NTI type platform or just be off if they have enough days in. And then of course the traditional calendar, go ahead and plan for a traditional calendar as you would uh, if COVID-19 wasn't around. And then of course a late calendar, be planning on an option of being able to pivot to an option of uh, starting school after Labor Day. But when you think about those three various op calendar options, then you have to layer in with that potential social uh, social distancing restrictions that may be in place for uh, large gatherings such as schools, even if you're allowed to have in-person classes, it, it is possible. There could be guidance from our uh, local uh, or state public health officials in the governor's office that, and I'm just using this as an example, um, maybe a, a student should be seated on every other seat on the bus, for example, and so that would obviously take a 60 passenger bus down to 30. Um, maybe the recommendation is that you, if you have 500 kids in a building, uh, you really need, from a public health perspective, to reduce that building load every day by half. So you need 250 per day, which <clears throat> you'd have to turn to alternating schedules. Some students coming in on Monday, Wednesday, some students coming in Tuesday, Thursday, etc. And so all of that is going to be layered in that, and we're developing a guidance document for districts uh, on, on to be thinking about that. So this is not going to be the year where families are going to be able to know what the calendar is now, which most, you, they would probably already know that by now, and they would already be planning their fall breaks. <clears throat> this is going to be the year where we all have to be flexible. We have to be nimble and uh, to be able to have all those options at the ready and to be able to pivot to that. <clears throat> I believe we are ahead other, of other states and that we do have the NTI platform that we're using. And that's continuing to evolve and get better every day. And we have obviously all of our teaching uh, core uh, working hard and have great experience with that if we have to pivot to that next uh, school year. So that that, that uh, describes phase two and, and layered in with all that, we're working uh, at the national level to make sure we are also learning from what other states are doing. In addition to sharing and getting advice from all of our advisories uh, and the um, task force that we put together on continuation of education. So, uh, for example, we're working with the Council of Chief State School Officers. On, we have meetings almost, I guess, two times a week. We are participating in the Southern Regional Education Board's uh, task force on continuation of education, and they are producing a, a playbook for schools and districts and states to assist in reopening, and we are heavily involved in that. And um, so a lot of work is going on. And for example, I'm also coordinating with uh, chief state school officers from the group of Midwest states that Governor Bashir and his team are coordinating with because those group of states are in a similar situation to Kentucky and been handling it similarly. And those are, I think, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota. I had a conference or a call one-on-one -on -one with the Minnesota chief um, uh, Tuesday, I believe. 
And so all of those efforts are informing uh, what we're advising districts and the key being getting, we want to get them a guidance document on the calendar uh, on or before May 15th. Uh, we uh, did extend the time that districts have to produce their calendar for next year until July 15th. So that gives a full two months for them to discuss that with their board. Obviously sounds a lot easier for me saying it right here than it's going to be on the ground for those districts. Um, but that's kind of the timeline that we're working on and we're going to have a more detailed superintendent webcast on Tuesday talking about the calendar issue. So that brings you up to speed as to kind of where things are on our radar, what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Karen to give you uh, from, from a project management perspective an overview and then Tony's going to give you a brief uh, overview of all of our communication efforts um, ar around all of this. So Karen, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You stepped all over everything I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, we all need to hear things, what, seven times before it really soaks in. So I'm going to be a little repetitive here with uh, just uh, what Kevin had said. Um, as he mentioned, in response to dealing with the crisis, we've put together, well, we've put on hold business as usual. And while our state goals are still incredibly important to everyone in education, the current pandemic requires that we utilize every resource to complete the current school year in the best way possible and begin planning for summer learning and feeding activities, as well as providing guidance for uh, reopening the schools in 2021. So achieve, to achieve that, we have made COVID-19 into a project. And that project, as Kevin said, has two phases. The first phase consisting of, um, from a project perspective, we're collecting all the resources. So the resources, guidance, waivers, communications, and any other artifacts that were created or received as the pandemic began. Um, all those items, we're collecting in phase one that uh, they pertain to closing out the current school year. Then as we move into phase two, um, that consists of planning for summer feeding and learning and as well as planning to reopen school in the fall. So I won't rehash all of that as Kevin already stated. Um, the project team is being led through the commissioner's office and it consists of points of contacts from each of the other offices within KDE. Uh, the project leadership team meets weekly, and then the full project team, that which includes all of the points of contact, also meet on a weekly basis. So those are two separate meetings. And then the project leadership team meets with each point of contact individually throughout the week as well. So a lot of contact there, making sure that all the wheels keep turning. Now, as we move forward, we've been really diligent and utilizing the commissioner's advisory groups, again, as Kevin said. And in addition to the traditional advisory groups, uh, Commissioner Brown established the Education Continuation Task Force. And the way we utilize each of these advisories and the task force is by sharing the guidance and the resources that we develop and then seeking their feedback. And we're very deliberate in our efforts to obtain that feedback. Uh, each agenda consists of the same topics so that all the groups are hearing the same information. And we also include uh, guiding questions for each topic. So while the topics are consistent across the groups, the questions differ with each group so that it's relevant to their perspective. And as we start, you, we've, we've just started using exit slips. And this is something that Tony came up with with the student group. Uh, it was working really well for her, so we've implemented that in all of the groups. And the exit slip is just a, a Google form that restates the guiding questions, and then we post a link to the form toward the end of the meeting so that those who haven't had a chance to speak up or maybe they just need more time to think about the topic, um, it gives them an opportunity to share their thoughts after at the end of the meeting or, or even after the meeting is ended. Uh, this has been working really well, and um, so from there, I just want to share with you some of the feedback that we've gotten through those exit slips from the various groups. Again, we just started this piece of the process, but we've had several meetings where we've gotten feedback. So first from the Education Continuation Task Force, this was just held Monday afternoon, 
and safety was their number one concern, followed by meeting the academic needs of students. Um, several of the partners uh, mentioned that they're willing and able to provide online and virtual PD utilizing the CARES Act money. Student learning will be challenged due to fatigue on behalf of teachers and students, as well as families having access to materials. And the biggest concern uh, with reentry consisted of the, the non-traditional end to the school year combined with summer slide. Um, and then the task force also wanted us to keep in mind the need to continue to show our gratitude to teachers and really stay attuned to their fatigue and offer more opportunities for teachers to connect with one another. Uh, then we had the Student Advisory Council on, I believe that one was on Tuesday, or was it Wednesday? Anyway. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we meet with them about every three weeks to check in on non-traditional instruction, their plans for graduation. Uh, 13 of the members are seniors, so it's very heavy on the senior side. And just check on, in on their social emotional issues, if, if, if any are being had. Uh, the students are realizing the importance of their voice during the crisis, and they're being really open and honest about how all of this is impacting both their, their academic life and their, their home life. Um, they also recognize the need to reach out to one another. And we heard some really great comments about <clears throat> how some of the kids are, are reaching out to others who they feel have become disengaged socially. And so they've been reaching out to them to, to bring them back in and engage them again. So that was really fantastic to hear. Um, and then Tony also uh, offered that uh, if any of them wanted to write a column, uh, we could have it published in the Kentucky Teacher. And two of those students wrote articles and they have been published. So that was really fantastic as well. Uh, then yesterday we had the local school board members um, advisory council and they were asked to think about uh, what concerns them as, uh, as, we, as we move into the re-entry of school. And some of the things that they pointed out were, again, very, very same things we're really hearing across the board. Students falling behind, um, students not being ready for transitioning to the next level. So whether that's going on to college or eighth graders moving into high school, whatever level they're at, there, there's that concern about are they ready for that transition. And then testing was also brought up, both the uh, testing for the virus, how will that happen at the, as schools reopen, and also determining uh, what, kind of, what kind of testing will there be to determine if students, where they are academically, so that teachers can effectively teach during the school year for kids where they are. And then the additional feedback we heard from them were uh, their desire to be in the discussions that pertain to the spending of the CARES Act money and uh, the need to focus on mental health issues when we reopen. And with that, unless anybody has any questions, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tony for the communication piece. I just, Tony, before you start, I want to point out that we asked the students the same exact or we, the same issues that we had asked the other advisory groups. So we treat the students are, are young adults and we treat them as adults. Um, they, you better eat your Wheaties when you get on the student advisory council or at, from my perspective, okay, because they ask great questions and they're very honest. And then the, I want to just also the exit slip. Uh, we discovered that while we get great feedback from the actual advisory council and this started, the exit slip started with the students, we found we got some different comments through the exit slips because it could be maybe a member of the advisory they weren't comfortable saying something out in you know on the meeting, uh, or it could be that they actually uh, actually had a little bit more time to think about. It. And we've all had that. You're driving away from a meeting and you're like, oh, I wish I would have said that. And so the exit slips we're going to use as Karen said in all of our advisories now because we find we're finding that that adds. Uh, more substance to what we actually heard and is more complete uh, and, and uh, accurate, I think, of what the advisory members are thinking. Absolutely. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with there. And I first um, have to give credit to the exit slips um, to the teachers. Obviously, you know, my background uh, was an education reporter for many, many years. 
And that is how I learned about exit slips was spending a lot of time in classrooms and learning that exit slips were used um, to check in with students after uh, an instruction. My husband is a teacher um, and learned that oftentimes that's how you capture whether they learned or whether they caught on what they were learning in class. So um, huge shout out to our teachers for teaching me that that's how uh, an effective way uh, to see how things are going. So with that, I am going to share my screen with you. And again, um, I'm kind of repeating some of the information that you have already heard, but I wanted to kind of put it in a visual way because again, I know we have a lot of uh, different learners in a different um, way. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. If you can let me know when you see it. Do you see it yet? Looks good. Okay, great. Um, so this is our second update. Um, thankfully, this is just a month from last time, so um, it's a little bit it's a little bit shorter than last time. Um, wanted to give you just a little bit of up, an update on where we've been um, as a department. Um, you know, we are still uh, obviously operating under the education feed and support. Uh, where we are committed to providing guidance and solutions that focus on um, providing all of the support to our districts and ultimately our children. Uh, we continue to meet three times a week to provide continued support um, and also hold these web weekly webcasts for superintendents uh, on COVID-19 uh, topics and information. And these have been very well received. Uh, we typically pick the topics during our um, KDE leadership team and a lot of times those uh, meetings, the topics are picked by our superintendents and our districts themselves, um, usually um, guided by you know, school closures or CARES Act money or budget. Um, but we've, we've had as many as six to 700 people tune in live, which is just unheard of for um, webcasts. The other thing I wanted to bring up to you is that um, our, our March 2020 feeding numbers, um, and I want to give a shout out to Robin uh, Kinney's office, in particular Lauren Moore's shop. This includes breakfast, lunches, and suppers. Um, the reason we have to report these a little bit later is because districts have until the 15th of each month to provide an update on meals that they have served the previous month. But during the month of March, we served more than 4.6 uh, million meals to 230,000 children. And as you can see, that's our average daily participation. And so I just included a couple of pictures there. You'll see, I believe, a Henderson County, Jefferson County, um, and then another uh, district there. Um, just some pictures from our district employees and families receiving meals during this time. We expect to have the April numbers here within the next week, and we will be sure to share those with you. Um, during this time, we provide a lot of time uh, guideline, and I wanted to give guidance, and we'll provide you a little bit with a timeline of that. Since our last update to KD, we facilitated another call um, between the superintendents and districts with the governor on, on April 20th, in which he recommended the cancellation, of course, of in-person classes for the remainder of the 1920 year. We issued the COVID-19 education continuation plan on the 20th. Um, as uh, Commissioner Brown had mentioned, this was to maximize the COVID-19 pan, uh, the, the instruction during the pandemic, while also utilizing the NTI to reach the 1062 hours of instruction. And all school districts will have reached those hours of instruction by NTI by uh, the 29th, and Fayette and Jefferson counties will be the last two districts to finish. Um, we also, through Rob Akers' shop, uh, issued a series of waivers to remove um, barriers to educator preparation, certification, and evaluation created by the COVID emergency. And on this slide, you will kind of see um, what those were, and uh, there's a link to that as well into the into on which these were required or allowed for under Senate Bill 177. Uh, we also issued, obviously, press releases and stories about all of these things as well. We also issued um, some timeline and guidance uh, issues related to the class of 2020 graduation alternatives and end of year procedures. This was done in conjunction with Dr. Ellis's office. Um, my team worked uh, with Dr. Ellis's office for about a week in conjunction with the Department for Public Health and the governor's office to ensure that the options that we are sharing with our schools and districts and that the questions that we were asking and answering um, were 
consistent to keep our schools and our students and families and communities safe during this crisis. Um, these documents, which are linked here, were shared um, with the public and our superintendents. They provide options and offer different questions that our district should answer and consider when making decisions about what kind of alternative graduation ceremonies they can have and consider, as well as um, letting students back into buildings to retrieve belongings and return school property. The other guidance that we are about to issue here within the next week uh, or two, we're gonna be releasing two separate guidance documents. And this is gonna be also in conjunction with Robin uh, Kinney's office and Dr. Kelly Foster's office is in regards to the CARES Act. Um, as you can see there, you've re already received some of the information uh, on the, the number of month, the amount of money that we are gonna be receiving. But we are working on guidance documents for our districts on both the GEAR Fund and ESRA Fund. And we expect to issue the GEAR Fund guidance later this week or early next week and the ESSER guidance will follow about a week later. The GEAR fund is gonna be a little bit shorter, about eight to nine pages, and the ESSER guidance is gonna be a little bit longer just because it's a significant more amount of money. Uh, we are working to uh, make this as, as reader friendly and as usable friendly for our districts so that they can find information quickly because we know that this information is, is gonna be very vital as to how they're going to spend this much needed money uh, as it regards to the COVID-19 crisis. The other guidance that we are prepared uh, to issue here soon is gonna be related to the start of the 2021 school year. Um, as Commissioner Brown mentioned, we're asking districts to be as flexible as they can to consider plans for the next year. We've ad advised districts to plan for multiple scenarios that might occur before and after the start of the year, which includes an early start, perhaps as early as late July, a traditional start and a late start, perhaps after Labor Day. We've advised superintendents they may wanna consider asking their local boards of education to approve multiple calendars to allow for the different scenarios. And we've also, um, as Commissioner Brown mentioned, that the resumption of these classes might come with a number of changes that will have to be made in interest of, of safety and health of our students and staff members. And our guidance documents will address these changes. And again, we will work with the Department of Health and the governor's office to focus on what is best for our students and, and our staff members. And we are currently preparing these guidance documents, which are expected to be released no later than May 11th. And then a little bit of our communications update. Uh, my staff has continued to work around the clock. Um, to provide uh, continued support to our schools, districts, and students in a number of ways. Uh, as mentioned, we've hosted four more special superintendents webcasts, all on topics related to COVID-19. Each webcast offers uh, a Q&A, and all of these are broadcasted publicly. We believe this is important, not just for our superintendents to provide uh, opportunities to ask us questions, but also for our families and school staff to hear uh, questions and answers as well, so that we can uh, provide answers so that they can get perhaps finance, get direct answers to questions that they might also have. We have published 22 new stories on Kentucky Teacher in the month related to COVID-19 crisis, including a feature story on how teachers from the Kentucky School for the Blind and the Kentucky School for the Deaf personally delivered NTI materials, of course, while social distancing, as you can see here on the right, um, with, to families across the state during uh, the week of April 20th. And it was another break, record-breaking month for Kentucky Teacher. We had almost 160,000 total page views for April. And in just the first four months of 2020, we've had more than 400,000 page views, which is more views than we had for all of 2019. With social media, we have continued to use our media channels to live tweet virtual meetings and regularly communicate updates on the COVID-19 crisis. As expected, our metrics on Facebook, Twitter, and Twitter went down slightly in April because we had saw we had seen substantial growth in March. The April numbers are still significantly higher than any previous month. Uh, the public is most interested in alternate schedules for 2021, graduation guidance, and Commissioner Brown's letters to families. Uh, we put a call out to superintendents to submit up to 10 photos of their graduating class of 2020 for a few projects that we are working on. We've received more than 2,000 photos from over 200 schools. And I wanted to share with you that um, over about since about a week ago, we've been sharing these. Uh, please check out our social media because we are using these photos that have been submitted to us in a variety of ways. And I'll share with you in just a minute another project that we're working on. 
Um, but we're doing uh, shout outs to our class of 2020. And these are just examples of what we're doing every day. We're posting a several, not just to Twitter, but to Facebook and also Instagram. So if you see them, please give them a, a little attention and maybe a retweet uh, and just uh, have a have a chance to to show our class of 2020 some some love. We're addition. We're also sharing uh, continued continued pictures and videos with the uh, lieutenant governor and governor's office to provide updates on what's going on in our districts during the crisis. Uh, we're working with um, our OET department to share more of Governor Bashir's videos from his press conferences, in which there are messages for children or families on the KDE YouTube channels. Our Student Advisory Council has really been a great source of uh, advice and support for us. We've hosted two more virtual, virtual meetings, as mentioned before. Um, over here on the left, you will see the one that we hosted on the 14th. And uh, just this week, we Lieutenant Governor Coleman popped in and surprised the students, which was a, a big hit with the students. They did not know she was going to pop in. And uh, they provided a lot of great insight uh, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but our advisory council is very senior heavy. We have 14 seniors that are going to be graduating from a uh, from from the class of 2020, and right now we are seeking applications, and we have over 89 applications in. So the interest for this council is very high, and I think that speaks to the value of the input that we receive. Um, and very excited to see what uh, comes next for this council, and to see what what our class of 2020 uh, graduates from this council will do. Our press releases, we've responded to more than uh, 20 requests from local and national reporters and media outlets over the past month. Uh, we've continued to coordinate interviews with KDE staff with local and national media outlets. We've sent out 29 press releases. 14 of those have been related to COVID-19. Um, also working with the Lieutenant Governor's Office and a few special guests on a special video tribute to the class of 2020 that will tentatively air the week before Memorial Day. We're very excited about this project. Um, I can't share very many details on that other than to say that um, I have four of my team members right now working on this project to give you an idea of how um, the magnitude of it. Uh, but it does involve the 2000 photos that have been submitted to us. And uh, just to tell you how important um, it is to recognize our class of 2020. It is a priority of, of my department um, and also those of uh, the KDE leadership team and many of our of our schools and districts as they as they graduate. And then also just a reference back to our COVID-19 page that was developed um, last month. We are continuing to see a lot of uh, hits on this page as people are directed to receive all information from KDE is from our official source of information on COVID-19. Um, Commissioner Brown's uh, letters to families, as mentioned before, he continues to write letters every week. These um, are continue to be very, very popular um, in terms of hits. Uh, people are sharing them. They're um, commenting on them uh, on both Facebook and on Twitter. And then this is like I did last month. This is just all the links. Uh, this is in case you want to go back and you've missed the story. These are everything just COVID related, uh, 19 related that we have done um, since the beginning of the crisis. And there's also, looks like I've locked up a little bit. Oh, there you go, sorry. There's a um, links to all the superintendent webcasts. And if you have any questions, you all know how to reach me. So that with that, I will, um, if you have any questions, I can also take them right now. I would say before questions, if I may, um, Quite frankly, I'm not sure how we're doing all this, um, and it's I guess due to adrenaline. And and I, this is not just for communications office, but for there there are similar type efforts. The magnitude of what Tony said and all the different things you can you can uh, put that on. Every office is doing the same thing in their areas, the same amount of volume uh, on on the issues they're responsible for, and it is it is unbelievable. Uh, that the staff at KDE, that we are all telecommuting, uh, it has been seamless to a person at the department and uh, just truly amazing. Uh, and this is also personal for Tony because she has a senior. And um, so uh, she cares about every 
uh, you can tell every senior in the state, but she also has one of her own. And uh, we, you know, we're do, we want to do this. And the, the lieutenant governor has has had uh, been a great partner with the idea that Tony shared. And one thing Tony didn't mention is we're also there's a national effort that we're also participating in through CCSSO. So those pictures that we're getting also are going to a national effort that uh, will be aired in some form or fashion, I think, with some various national celebrities, et cetera. So there, there will be a lot, of, a lot of ways to honor the seniors. Unfortunately, it won't be uh, as they envisioned. And, but, and I would also reiterate a lot of the questions you may be getting in your communities is graduation. That's been obviously a, a hot topic. And just to summarize, we work really closely with the governor's office, lieutenant governor, secretary's office, um, and also, of course, public health in providing the three graduation options for districts. And of course, the first one is completely virtual uh, in a virtual environment. And then the second one would be the drive up, drive in, drive through graduation option, which uh, is uh, modeled after what uh, houses of worship are utilizing, but they must use the same rules that you've heard Governor Bashir state on the uh, press conferences and then the third is what we call the Gulfport Mississippi model we believe this model originated there in Gulfport Mississippi where students are given an appointment time they show up with a very limited number of family members perhaps no more than I think generally four they walk in at an appointed time say it's one o'clock in the afternoon they walk into the gym there's a picture they get a picture and there's the appropriate staff members and administrators there on stage, very limited, six feet apart at least. They get their diploma. There's no one else there in the facility. It's also recorded using video. And then maybe at 120, the next student comes in. Um, and so what happens with that in that model is then the video is then spliced together and edited together. And then all the seniors in the community will have a video showing each senior one after the other getting their diploma. Those are the three models that are being utilized and um, districts have really taken off with these. Uh, it's certainly not the same, uh, but I've been really proud of districts. And then before we go to the next thing, I do want to sum up um, again, talking about how the districts have really uh, been so flexible and willing to do everything. When we announced to the districts in the last superintendent webcast about the need to be flexible uh, again, to continue to be even more flexible than they've ever been at the beginning of the next school year with all of these multiple scenarios that could come into play for opening school or even temporary closing school because of the uh, data uh, and the uh, cases that may or may not be present with COVID-19. I received and I closed the superintendent webcast by reading this text from a superintendent. And this, this text is so typical of the responses we're getting from superintendents and and it recognizes the the uh, heavy lift but then you li listen to the end of it and so this is in response after i just said you need to have three different scenarios and then if you have three scenarios you may actually have to do social distancing and so the superintendent said this may be doable but there are a thousand hypotheticals to plan for also financial impact could be incredible i.e. multiple bus runs for the same location. We are all in, but this is going to be difficult to keep people motivated, patient, and moving, but we can do it. And, and that, that's just, I'm finding that with every, um, every district. And that doesn't, I'm not trying to gloss over that we have problems. We're not reaching some kids and we don't reach kids every day in a traditional environment. And we certainly are not reaching every kid and every family in this challenging environment. We have obviously this presents issues with how we've delivered special ed services, et cetera. But the fact that all of these districts are willing to do this and, um, and that's everybody in the district, everybody, the, uh, every, all the employees and staff and teachers and in the communities, it's been pretty amazing. Yes, and I've been, oh, go ahead. Thanks, Kevin. I know we still have a topic in the appropriate right now that I would just um, echo the Herculean effort um, that you and the KDE team and our districts across Kentucky are engaging in right now. I love the Wayne Gretzky quote that 
great leaders skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And right now, nobody can figure quite out can quite figure out where the puck is even going to land. But the um, ubiquitous communication, the creativity, the broad collaboration that you and your team have demonstrated, just the sheer accessibility that we can all text you um, when we need a little bit of comfort is is really remarkable. And so thanks to everybody, including Robin and the team coming up in terms of budget for all of the work that you're doing and for the, the real vision that you have for supporting our schools and districts through these times. I would, I would like to make a comment. This is Joanne Adams. Uh, I couldn't be prouder to be a Kentucky educator at this point. Our teachers and families have risen up to do what they need to do like they always do. And um, the reason, though, that this has gone as seamlessly as it has is because of the leadership. And I know this because I received an a email from um, Terry Price, who is the superintendent of Henry County Schools. And he said, this commissioner, interim, I know, is doing an outstanding job communicating with us. He also has various KDE leadership on the webcast to address issues. I applaud KDE's efforts. They are doing a good job. So well done. We all appreciate you all. It's been an amazing feat that you all have accomplished. Thanks so much. Lovely. Thank you, Joanne. This is Lee, Lee Todd. I'd just like to second that and third that. Uh, it's kind of like trying to play three-dimensional chess without any rules. You don't know how to win. Uh, you just have to invent something at each move, and you all have done it. And <coughs> what's amazing is the morale, and I give uh, the commissioner a lot of credit for that, obviously, uh, just to keep going when you just don't know what else is going to be asked of you. Um, I do have a question about um, the what has been done with the students who have had lack of access to the internet, um, and um, what percentage of the students do you feel fit in that category? I haven't seen a lot on that, but if this isn't the right time to ask that question, we can wait till later. If, if uh, th this is Mike Bowling, and I'm sorry that I'm interrupting uh, Lee. That was a good question, obviously, but I've got a Pine Mountain Regional Industrial Board meeting in an hour, and I anticipate this would be over by 11, so I'm going to have to excuse myself, okay? Sure. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Todd, that's certainly a, an appropriate question, and the timing uh, is, is perfect. Uh, I, I neglected to say that we obviously wanted to invite as many questions as necessary, and that's one reason we didn't just have a lot of uh, presentations. We wanted to have, we knew that there would be questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Foster or David Cook, you may want to comment on this. There are various scenarios that districts are using, and um, procedures and plans to reach students that don't have access. Uh, some of those include getting them actual uh, uh, equipment, technology, uh, Chromebooks, and then also partnering with other uh, with inter uh, providers to provide hotspots, et cetera. And then also on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, the paper packets uh, that have been delivered and then are, there are continual uh, contact with students or de delivery and receipt of those type of materials. So Kelly, do you want to give a summary? And I'm not sure. sure if we have numbers on that. I can tell you right now uh, that we are averaging around 91 and 92 percent participation rate in NTI. And that's information that the districts are submitting to KDE. And so what we could, uh, since everyone will be finished by the June board meeting, we will definitely provide an update that will give you final numbers on what that looked like. But everything that Kevin is referencing is exactly like exactly right. It looks different in different districts. Uh, for, for example, JCPS, Jefferson County Public Schools, uh, they were the last district to join. They had the biggest lift. They had not previously been an NTI district. Um, their district bought uh, between 20 and 25,000 Chromebooks to uh, help meet the needs of, of some of their highest risk students. And so, you know, that's quite amazing. Uh, we have other districts who, um, you know, don't have that type of technology, and they are, I've, I've seen things across the state where they're delivering packets when uh, they're delivering meals. 
Uh, we had a webinar about a week ago or so where we had teachers across the state and it was specifically for Kentucky teachers. And we had teachers from across the state at the elementary, middle and high school level. Some work in districts that have been non-traditional instruction districts for several years. Some of them were brand new and it was really amazing to hear their stories. Um, they talked about the challenges that they were facing, but what I found um, just unbelievable was they have embraced this uh, and they've embraced it through technology. They have embraced it through phone conversations. Um, they have embraced it through the packet system. And, um, you know, I, maybe in the future we could get a couple of those teachers to come uh, and, and share kind of their stories with you all at a meeting because um, I actually text Kevin during that presentation and said, you know, here we all are all just, you know, worn out and covered up with online meetings and it, it's very stressful, but to hear them, it was so refreshing because it reminded me of what, you know, what we're doing this for and what a great job that our Kentucky teachers are doing. So I would say right now we're averaging between 91 and 92% participation rate. Uh, it's a, a wide variety of uh, services, but I definitely will at the Georgia, Georgia at the June board meeting, uh, be able to give you some final numbers. Okay. Yeah, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how many doctoral theses are gonna be written over the years <laughs> about what, what worked and what did not work. But I think just the, the things that you all ran through that you are doing is a tremendous list. I'm not sure people appreciate the um, the invention on the fly that you've had to go through to reach these kids who uh, have not been reachable electronically. And I hope, I hope it gives a message to our leaders that it's time to get the internet throughout the whole state. Uh, it's just vitally important. Because can you imagine the, the usefulness it could be to them even in normal times? much less under these abnormal conditions. So thank you very much for all that you're doing. Well, and I, and I think it's worth saying publicly, you know, a huge shout out to David Cook, who's one of the directors in my office and his small team uh, that he has that has really helped um, have get NTI in every district in the state and they're providing daily guidance to districts. And then also just the support from the teachers and the principals and the district leadership. I mean, what they have done in a short amount of time is, is tremendous. And we really appreciate everyone in the local districts embracing the change. Dr. Todd, this, this is actually David. <laughs> How yeah. are you? All right, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add to that um, and give a shout out to the other David C that is probably on this call, David Couch. Right. who you have shouted out to before because we couldn't have even done what we've done and what we've done is amazing with these districts 172 of them all at once if we didn't have already have about 84 percent of our kids with access to the internet so just the fact that we were already positioned that way and the other thing i would say is districts have really figured out how to create lessons that can be done either digitally or paper-based. They're not two different lessons. They're a lesson that they probably created digitally and then they transferred it to a paper base. So the kids are doing the same lessons. They're just not being delivered the same way. That's great. Uh, I will put it with this question or statement, but ha have you used the STLP folks in any particular capacity to help? Uh, but I know they're distributed now, but just uh, kept track yeah. of that effort for a long time. Absolutely. Um, what we have now, if, if you're sure you're aware, is a whole digital learning team under David um, that where those STLP folks sort of reside. And Marty Park and his staff, another shout out, have been tremendously helpful in providing professional learning to teachers and administrators during this time. Um, and we, we need, we're going to do more of that. That's obviously what we want folks to use some of their uh, gear funds for is to do more professional learning for teachers around remote learning. Thank this you. is Allison. I'd like to kind of jump in for a moment since I am someone here on the board that with their boots still on the ground and, and I don't know how I managed to check off so many boxes, but I am a current teacher. I also have a child with a learning disability and I have a senior, so I have several perspectives I can share. But um, from the teacher perspective, um, kind of share the difference I've seen over the, the couple of months that we've been doing this um, in my online platform. The first week or two was a lot of people um, asking questions, you know, pretty nervous, people that never done NTI instruction before. Um, 
wanted to know how to do things, you know, teachers that had not even um, been in some of this virtual platforms and used those things and, and very nervous and doing stuff and people sharing resources. But within like, uh, and I'm not kidding, within like three weeks, um, that changed. And it was kind of, it was very interesting to watch how the mindset of the teachers and the interactions of the teachers changed so quickly. Um, they went from asking a lot of questions to sharing resources. Hey, I've, sh I've done this and it worked great. And here's how you do this. And here's this great place where you can do this. Um, and then within another week or so, maybe four to five weeks into this, it was boots on the ground and people sharing their videos and how they're doing stuff. So just give you a little picture of some of the stuff I've seen and some of the stuff I've done. Um, I have a case of about 20 kids myself with uh, different, various special needs and you know, trying to meet those needs, but also trying to find platforms that parents, families were comfortable with using. So, you know, in my own district, we do have the packets for those students and families that didn't have the, the resources to use the technology. Then we went more technology and using a lot more of that stuff. Now we're doing choice boards so that students, and you know, a lot of feedback we got were that students were overwhelmed. You know, there was a lot of work and parents trying to work full time and teach students their kids at the same time. So we're doing choice boards where kids only have to choose one or two activities a day. So I think that's been really neat to see. Um, but in my own experience, and I've seen that with many teachers, we've tried to figure out ways that um, we can connect with those kids. So for instance, if I had a student that I couldn't connect with or I couldn't you know, find them, I would check in with their gen ed teacher and make sure that they had at least made contact with them. And then if they hadn't, then we referred them to the counselor. And then from there, we go to the youth service center so that they could do a home visit so that we made sure every child had been connected with in one way or another, because we definitely didn't want to um, lose connection with those kiddos. Um, and then from there, the ones that were connected, some of them, and, and quite frankly, just weren't comfortable with using some of the platforms. You know, they they didn't know how to use them. They weren't comfortable in using Zooms and those kind of things. So we had to keep trying to reinvent the wheel. So I have some students who I make phone calls to, uh, FaceTime with, because most all the students have at least a cell phone or their parents do. So that's one way to connect. And then um, I do Zoom calls with some students that want to jump on those conference calls and interact that way. Um, and then I still had families that weren't comfortable with those things. Um, but a lot of them I realized were comfortable with social media. So then I developed a Facebook group. That's just a closed environment for my students and their parents because then I got a lot more parents involved because they knew how to use that. So we have to think about not just are we meeting the needs of the students, we have to meet the unique needs of the families as well now. So it's it's quite challenging, but um, I love to brag on our teachers because I have seen an absolute amazing transformation um, over these just few weeks. And and like Kevin said, we didn't give up, you know, and we, we were determined as teachers in this state to do whatever it took to meet the needs of our kids. That doesn't mean we didn't have hard days. Um, there were days when we'd rely on each other and cry on each other's shoulders and say, how do we get through this? Um, but, you know, when, as Kevin said, they made the announcement that we're going to continue, we just, you know, put on our big girl pants and decided to get at it. And, and that's what we did. And, and there's no complaints. There's just how can we do this and how can we do it better? And, and if we're in this situation again in the future, we've got a lot under our belt now and we know what we're doing. So I think we just keep moving forward and keep improving. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much for that and for your voice. If you all haven't seen yesterday's Business Insider, there's a great article about our own Allison and her network Lee Kentucky teachers in the know in Facebook is 20,000 plus uh, public educators strong so we're really excited about that and just as a reminder you heard it in Allison's intro they're doing all this while caring for their own families um, their own ill loved ones and um, just complete selflessness and Kelly and David, thank you so much for the update. We look forward to more details in response to Lee's question um, at the June meeting. And um, if you could, anything that you can find out and share with us about um, access for our homeless learners. I know in Jefferson, that's 10,000 strong. So um, if we could, certainly that keeps me up at night, if we could hear more about what you all know or can find out in June about um, our homeless students across the Commonwealth um, through the crisis would be really helpful as well. Um, we are still doing well on time. I know we still have a budget update, but if there are other uh, board members that would like to add anything or have questions before we shift to uh, back to Kevin and then on to Robin and her team, I think we could easily take another five minutes or so if you would like to chime in. Uh, uh, 
That's okay. Um, I just wanted to um, kind of go back to the student advisory group um, that that uh, KDE has been working with. And thank you to Tony and Kevin for including me in that. Uh, I get asked a lot, what do you miss most about um, education? And it's the students. And so uh, being able to talk to them and um, listen to them. Um, was a really valuable um, experience, and it it was uh, it was a welcome one, considering that I miss those opportunities. Um, and you're right; they have they have great input, um, they have great insight, and I love that we include their voice in this process. I think that's really important. Um, in regards to the um, the big question mark about where are we going and how are we going to get there, um, the commissioner and I. Um, have had lots of conversations about uh, moving forward in the education world. And um, the moving hockey puck is a really good um, analogy. It really is. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that um, I have been, con I've been participating in regional meetings with superintendents across the state uh, to first of all, let them know that they have our support and we understand um, we're asking them to do the impossible. Um, and to do it well, and to do it safely for our kids. And um, so, you know, our my office and and uh, and when I say my office, I mean the governor's office and the lieutenant governor's office will continue to support um, our superintendents and school districts and work with them uh, to provide as much safety and security for our students as we can. That is that is first and foremost. Um, you know, I think about this as a teacher in my classroom and how do you space out students six feet apart, if that's what it still looks like in, you know, a few months. I think about it as an assistant principal of trying to uh, control and monitor um, activity in the hallway and the lunchroom and common areas like the gym. And, uh, you know, it's like the text message to Kevin said, there are a thousand different scenarios to try to prepare for. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that um, as a board that we keep an open mind and realize that we are crossing into turf that none of us have ever could have ever anticipated. And the best thing that we can do is continue to provide support, be an ear for the folks in your life who are going to be in the trenches, uh, because we have got to make sure that those voices are heard and that the challenges that the folks on the ground are going to face um, are challenges that we think about and we plan for, um, you know, again, making sure that that teacher voice and subsequently that student voice is a part of this process is going to be really important. So I know all of you are, are, um, committed to that. Um, and so we've got to be even more diligent about that moving forward. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is Claire Bat, and I would like to follow up with a question, but first, I want to give my thanks to everybody who has just bent over backwards to help our students be successful during this difficult time. But um, I have had a couple questions come to me about um, site-based council elections and what is what the status of those is and what are the plans for going forward during this time. And I know Kevin has some guidance out on that. So Kevin, do you want to take that question from Claire? We do. We have guidance. And then, Kelly, I'll have you back me up. Um, Dr. Foster uh, have issued guidance to SBDMs about how to conduct those elections virtually and online. Um, and then, Kelly, do you have some additional details? Yes, I'm trying to pull that up, so I'll have it right in front of me. Give me just one second. Um, so we sent out to site-based decision-making coordinators in districts. Um, last week and we also sent out um, the guidance in the Monday email this week to give them something to think about as far as um, the safe way they could do different type of elections. So what I'll do is I will uh, send this to Jennifer Fraker and actually get it posted in the chat. Um, that way we can, um, you can have it in front of you. But that guidance has gone out to each district site-based coordinator as well to superintendents. So we have suggested things like um, a Google Forms or Survey Monkey uh, for since they won't be able to do face-to-face -face, um, voting. And I actually um, have heard from several schools that have been doing online voting in the last couple of weeks. But I'll get that guidance posted in the chat. 
Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Claire. Um, I have a question, Sharon Robinson. Um, thinking about the seniors and uh, always thinking about our efforts to inspire and support their uh, their transition to some uh, formal post-secondary education experience. I'm wondering, um, I hope Dr. Thompson's still on, yeah. uh, how we are talking, how we are engaging with these seniors uh, about their uh, subsequent career and education planning. And, um, you know, while we can't say enough about what we're doing in the here and now and the, I mean, I call it a heroic effort on the part of Kentuckians to see to the educational and, and nutritional and social emotional well-being of our students. But facing the future is a part of it. And um, I know that there are plenty of questions there, but uh, probably more questions than answers. Uh, how are we supporting them and encouraging them with that next big ambiguity that they've got to face, that we all will face. Sharon, I, I'm gonna ask uh, Kevin to jump in on this conversation with me too. This is an area that we are extremely concerned about in more ways than one, since Kentucky had another year of declining college going um, by almost two percentage points, which isn't great, you know, at 51.7 now. What we're doing, we're, we're doing it at uh, three different levels, actually. Our gear up schools, we're doing everything from taking signs to their yard, uh, saying class of 2020. Uh, you know, we're doing virtual make your plans for your college uh, career. We're doing, we're going over their plans, talking with their parents. We're even sending them postcards in the mail. Uh, our post-secondary institutions, as you all know, we are... Nationally, they're probably thinking there's going to be about a 20% decline uh, in people going to college. We're trying to mitigate that tremendously uh, in Kentucky. So our post-secondary institutions are out purposefully doing some of the summer things our gear up uh, community are doing uh, in doing that. What we really know is that students are more anxious to find out whether or not we're going to be open. Yes, we are. And uh, we've submitted our plans uh, to make sure that we're opening in a safe way. Uh, the other thing we're letting people know is that we're going to learn from our we're at many students that are concerned about w whether or not they can do online and do it properly. Uh, and I appreciate the commissioner saying that Kentucky P-12 was a little bit ahead of the game nationally. But uh, higher education, you know, our community college system and so on has been ahead of the game nationally so they're reaching out really within their communities to let people know if they need to even have help uh, to know how to do it we're doing it but our four-year institutions we're letting people know we are going to be open face-to-face -face in some form so those uh, students that want a residential experience uh, we're going to give them that unless something dramatic happens so what we're doing is at every level possible even the old way of uh, sending notes uh, and, and offering ourselves up virtually to those and letting them have a way to contact us, even through my office, but to the institutions themselves. So more than ever, I would say that even with our limited exposure to people face to face, we're being far more proactive and innovative about doing this. Now, I, I would lie if I didn't say there was a good business reason to do that. But first of all, we're not doing it for that reason alone. We're doing it because we know that many of these students are semi-frightened about that transition. They didn't have their typical uh, end of uh, their senior year experience on a P-12 campus. And they may not have a very historical, normal uh, opening freshman year. But what we do know is that we're trying to ensure them that they will have a post-secondary experience that is very helpful and healthy. And so uh, I would uh, love if the commissioner would probably jump in on this conversation because this is truly where it is, a partnership that we're gonna have to use to make this happen. 
Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I completely agree. Actually, before we even knew what COVID-19 was, I attended a, a CPE meeting and Dr. Thompson gave an overview of his findings from his, I think he did a, a statewide listening tour in the fall. And one of the things that he flagged and he kept hearing from uh, first year students or students that are in some form of post-secondary was uh, things they wish they had known uh, uh, when they were in high school, meaning, you know, we needed to do a better job uh, in uh, secondary of transition. So it, it was, it's a, it's what you describe is a deficiency we were having uh, even before we got to a uh, pandemic where we're not ending the school year in a normal way. And we, we're not having physical contact with our students. And then you layer on the issue of not having enough guidance counselors in any of our schools um, you know, uh, staffing issue and a, a very high ratio of guidance counselors to number of students uh, makes that problem worse. But uh, I, I would ask Dr. Ellis to comment on some of the things that we are doing and some guidance we're providing right now uh, related to this. Absolutely. So um, just to echo the words of Kevin and Erin, we have actually reached out to CPE for some of the things that the post-secondary institutions are already offering their students because in our student advisory earlier, I think this week, um, the students shared that their concern when we asked them about how to provide summer support and how we could um, prevent barriers or offer supports to families or students, what were we missing? And we went through a litany of things that we wanted to post and the students said, we're still nervous about going to college. We're still nervous about the transition. And so to your point, um, absolutely, we said we hear you. And so um, we've been working with Dr. Damian Sweeney, who is our comprehensive um, counseling coordinator, and he has posted um, several resources and materials online. And we're going to be very intentional on uh, even the resources we provide on how do you prepare for that transition. Um, the students had brought up to us their concern about the transition from either fifth grade, even in a middle school, and middle school into high school. And then them, most of them, as Tony had said earlier, being seniors, they're very nervous about transitioning uh, into post-secondary decisions, whether it's an institution or the workforce or wherever it may be. So um, we've really appreciated the resources that CPE has shared with us on just what some of the institutions are doing. So we can share that with our seniors and our uh, school staff because we want it to be a seamless uh, transition for them. They've already had enough disruption in their life. And this is a big milestone on a normal year, whatever normal is. And so um, I really appreciate you asking that question because um, we absolutely want to be in line and we want them to successfully transition. So Dr. Sweeney is on that and providing resources and we'll be posting those with our summer supports um, as well as just how we continue to support our families um, and our students. Uh, and that really goes under the social emotional needs as well. Um, and we have a lot of resources posted on that um, online and, and are making that available and easily to um, access. But I really appreciate your question. Thank you. Sharon, I'd like to add a little more if I could. I know we're probably out of time, Lou, for this answer, but one of the things that I, I do want to thank Kevin and Amanda and others because they have truly did not take what we heard on our year-long listening to her as a negative, but as a way to develop a better methodology of giving our students what they need. I've had a chance now to talk with several superintendents who are doing very similar things that I mentioned that our, uh, uh, that our uh, gear up folk were doing. The item that I will tell you, and I, this is not a caution, but this is a call out, I guess. And I call this out with our presidents as we meet weekly, as well as our chief academic officers, that this is a time for us to think about truly what we haven't done well, or maybe not changed over the many years of thinking about recruiting students and making post-secondary a viable option. So the idea that we're taking this time also to think innovatively, being forced into this, I think, is a way that we can say, what are some of the things and resources we've used that haven't been very successful? So we're also using this as a research experiment to find out if some of the things that we're doing, because we have to do now, are things that we need to put in our normal uh, circumstances once we get to this new normal. The other item I will say in my last item on this 
if students need to know, and I've talked to a lot of uh, uh, P-12 students and post-secondary students a lot of years, but over last year particularly, talking about the value of college and why higher education matters. And what we're hearing, I think, are sea change sorts of items that this board really needs to take into account. As I've told my board at CPE, that we need to take into account. I mean, they are truly asking for more social, emotional, and academic help. And we're finding out the issues of mental health, as we've said before, is huge. So we're trying to structure even a virtual environment for mental health counseling on our campuses that we may not have thought about before. But we're also needing to help our students understand what college is, probably more in P-12, not just in the typical college and career counseling, but in a way that they can see themselves, even high-performing academic students in K-12, are saying, well, I don't think I'm college ready. So this is really not about making them academic ready alone. This is about making them socially, emotionally, and culturally ready in addition. So I would hope that as we move forward in the new normal, my board and this board can really work strongly hand in hand to think about that as a protocol for the future. Aaron, thank you so much. And everyone, the last thing I want to do is to call a halt to an important and rich discussion, but I do want to make sure that we respect your time and our agenda for today. So if we might just pause uh, questions and comments for right now and then turn it over to Kevin to introduce Robin and her team, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes uh, before noon to open back up any other uh, board member feedback. Yes, thank you. Uh, I also wanted to mention, related to Dr. Todd's, uh, I think mentioned STLP, and it may probably will not surprise you because this is STLP. STLP is still ongoing, and actually, uh, even though the number of participants is down because we're not meeting in person, as you all were to meet at STLP in April, uh, in true STLP fashion, they found an alternative way to do things, and so. Uh, uh, the actual state championship uh, is ongoing, and the state champs will be identified early this afternoon, according to uh, David Couch. And I've asked David to give you a little update in June at your June meeting about the outcome. And, of course, you'll see some press on this. Um, that's another thing to celebrate, that, that uh, such a great program uh, continued on in a, in a virtual environment. So um, more to come on that. I do, uh, we probably should have rearranged the agenda a little differently because we're going to end on a somewhat of a negative note and discussing the budget and some uh, implications that are not positive uh, ahead of us in our school districts. Uh, this is under the uh, 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 coronavirus discussion, but it's a, it's larger than that. It's going to be a discussion, a, a briefing on, on some things that have happened recently with the uh, predictions for the state budget, et cetera, uh, that involve the entire K-12, uh, our P-12 budget. And uh, you already heard a little bit about CARES Act funding. She, uh, Robin may actually touch on that and Charlie as well, but primarily this discussion is going to be on um, the actual overall state budget for uh, P P-12 education. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Robin and Charlie. Thank you so much. Um, it's nice to see all you virtually today. Um, if I can start for just a minute, I know we've spent a lot of time today, and rightfully so, recognizing all of our heroes out in local school districts, whether it be superintendents, teachers, families, students. And if I could just start, even though a lot of my news is um, sometimes discouraging at times, um, I want to give a shout out to all of our operations people out there. So, our operations folks, meaning our finance officers, our DPPs, our food service people, all those nurses and health coordinators, um, our facilities folks, our pupil transportation people, all those people are usually, um, I would say, a little more behind the scenes when we talk about the instruction and, and the things that we're doing in the classrooms. But really, without these operational folks, um, nothing else can go. And so they are really rising to the challenge as well, uh, as a, in addition to the, all the other folks that we've talked about. Um, these are the silver linings that we see. Um, they, are, they are rallying around. And every time that we make a decision, which is on more the instruction side, of course, that has a tendency to impact them and how they're going to operate and how they're going to make sure that things continue to go smoothly. 
We have had several opportunities to have superintendents webcast that we've actually had jointly with our finance officers, uh, recognizing that it's good for them to hear the same thing at the same time. And uh, staff primarily in my office continue to have these break off sessions with um, teams meetings or uh, virtual meetings with their particular interest groups. So they're having those one-on-one -on -one calls with finance officers so that they can drill down into issues that are important to them. And DPPs, you know, they want to talk about coding and which box do you put something in. And all that's really important. It'll be important for tracking and uh, being held accountable and making sure at the end of the day that we can use that information to learn about how to get better and do things well. So before we start, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Really, really important um, functions that they are handling as well and doing a really, really good job along the way, just like all the other people that are participating. Um, I will give you just a minute update on the CARES Act um, to let you know, I think since the last time we spoke, um, the two pots of money that we are primarily focusing on related to CARES, the elementary and secondary schools emergency um, fund, which um, is a broader pot of money that about $194 million will be coming to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And then the GEARS fund, the governor emergency uh, fund that will be coming to us about $43 million, of which $30 million will be coming to our local school districts. Both of those um, pots of money through cross-agency efforts of the department here, um, applications have been submitted with the help of the lieutenant governor and the cabinet. Uh, the governor's emergency fund was submitted. Um, all of the, both of those applications have now been approved. So they've been approved by U.S. Ed. I, I want to be very complimentary of the quick turnaround and the easy process that U.S. Ed provided to states so that we could turn around and, and start working on getting that money out. Um, we heard some conversations today about, you know, technology. And so, so that you will know for the governor's emergency fund, uh, we are asking districts to focus on two areas. We, we have heard about um, the technology needs of our students, remote learning. Um, this will probably become our new normal. So it is important both short term and long term for, for us to invest in technology and remote learning for students and for staff. So that's one area that they can spend their governor's emergency fund money on. The other is that continued push for food service. As we continue to really see across the nation, the, um, the food banks and other uh, community action efforts, all those efforts that are trying to feed our population, lots of people that have never had to access that before are, are finding the need to have to turn to uh, uh, different types of access to food. So we continue to encourage districts to the extent possible to continue to provide that. We need our students to continue to be well-fed so that they can they can participate and learn, and uh, that helps take the stress on off some of their family as well. So as we go into the, quote, summertime, um, into school, uh, we will continue to encourage and focus on food service delivery. So those are a couple of things, and, and we do, we will have guidance. Um, I think Dr. Foster had mentioned, we will send guidance to our districts on all the permissible uses of uh, the funds. Uh, the ESSER fund is a little more broad. Um, there are lots of things that districts can use this money for. I guess the thing that I would caution is uh, they will have short-term needs, and then there will be long-term needs um, associated with this. And like all federal funds, at some point it will run out. So we will encourage them not to um, expend on recurring costs as much as taking care of those one-time things as they roll along. Um, for purposes of really what we wanted to share with you today, and I'm going to invite um, my budget director, Charlie Harmon, to join me at the virtual table as we talk about uh, the financial um, forecast, I guess we would say. Um, it is a time of uncertainty, but we have received a little bit of information um, that is going to impact the KDE budget, and I'd like him to kind of share that with you. That, that came out last week. And then as we look forward, we're seeing some information that's being shared publicly about the 
um, future outlook for the first six months of next fiscal year. So, Charlie, if I could ask you to come to the virtual table and talk a little bit about what we're seeing from the economic side. Charlie, you may be muted. Oh, is it? How about now? Hey, Charlie, we can hear you now. Thank you. And Joette, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So as Robin mentioned, um, every quarter, the Office of the State Budget Director releases a quarterly economic activity report. And at the end of April, they released a report for the third quarter of FY20. And in that, in that document, they talk about revenues from every category. And it kind of, uh, it's a very detailed document, it's probably 35 or 40 pages long. And it kind of says that Kentucky in the first three, the first uh, two and a half quarters of the fiscal year was doing really good. And in the last month of the third, second quarter, um, we struggled a little bit. And then they're predicting uh, a few speed bumps for the fourth quarter. So um, in dollar amounts, they're predicting a revenue shortfall for the current fiscal year of around of th between 318 and 495 million. So, so that's on a basis of a $11.4 billion uh, general fund state budget. So although that much money, that magnitude in the hundreds of millions of dollars is very significant, um, in, in the scheme, it's, it's equating to around a 12.5% cut to state government agencies. So, so these numbers are really important and they're caused um, at least indirectly by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as you know, um, our unemployment is up really, really high, highest ever. Um, right now it's at around 25%. The state has an unemployment rate. Um, and of course, you know, um, uh, payroll taxes is a big uh, piece of revenue for governments. So that's that's a big deal there. And when people are making less, they're spending less. Um, as as well as uh, other taxes are down too. So so when we're talking about that, the department uh, received a letter um, that says you all you all being every state government agency uh, need to consider making a preliminary plan for the current fiscal year. So that's between now and June thirtieth to reduce your general fund budget by 1%. So 1% in a fiscal year is now about 12 and a half percent with the, with only, you know, seven weeks left in the fiscal year. So, you know, for the department, we haven't completed our plan yet, but the good thing about this is with, with the, with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are being forced to do things differently, which also, um, is allowing us to spend money a lot slower. So we've got a few areas uh, that we're that we're tapping there uh, that are going to we're going to recommend to come up with some uh, savings, as well as we've got some personnel vacancies and some travel that's not occurring related to the COVID pandemic, which is also going to going to allow us to tap into those funds. Um, uh, the governor's office, state budget director's office, is you know treating the department more than fair. They've exempted the SEEK funds. Of course, we call SEEK SEEK, but that's just state general fund revenues. So it's just the taxes that uh, that we all pay to uh, the revenue cabinet. So they've exempted that because uh, that would be a huge hit to uh, local school districts. And they've also uh, excluded a local district health insurance, which is $750 million. So if we had to take a percentage off that, that would be a significant amount. So uh, the state budget director's office is to be commended, at least from the education community. Uh, we expect our reduction to be in the neighborhood of around three million. You see there, three million seventy-one thousand six hundred. Um, we have every intention of meeting that target, um, and every agency, I'm sure, is going to do their best to meet their targets as well. Uh, Joette, you can go to the next slide. 
So, so that's FY20. Um, basically, we, we, we think we can finish um, with little or no impact uh, to school districts directly related to this uh, reduction. Uh, for FY21, we can't be quite as sure. Um, we already started um, with a one-year budget, which is the first time I think that's ever, well, since we've had biennial budget, that that's ever happened. Um, so we've got House Bill 352 that's enacted. And of course, with all the statutes that we have that are, we call unfunded mandates, you know, we've got standards development and implementation that, that we have to do that is not funded. We were not given additional funds for that. Industry certifications, um, part of Dr. Foster's team, turnaround audits and CSI support. We've got a, we got a brand new school report card that's um, light years better than what we had before. And of course, once again, we had to do that and we didn't get any extra funding for that. Um, so we're still trying to, to, to complete all these goals and responsibilities, um, but it's hard when you're not given extra funds to do that. Um, the department is continually trying to, trying to be as frugal as humanly possible. Um, we, we constantly look at uh, ways to keep our expenditures down because every time we have a reduction in revenue, um, our first our first thought is how what can we do to not impact districts or minimize the district minimize the in, impact on our school districts so you know we always look at personnel in the department operating costs travel costs and our personal service contract costs um, you know we, that's always our first place to look and then the next place we look to do reductions is on our programmatic offerings which would be a more direct impact to districts one thing that Kevin, I know, is uh, our Commissioner Brown is um, interested in sharing in the near future is the cabinet staffing over the years. Uh, he's asked for a, I think it's 25 year report to be done on on um, our staffing over the years, which is which directly impacts the services that we provide to districts. And uh, you'll be you'll be um, interested to see that when it comes out soon. We've also got COVID-19 recession um, that it's continuing. Um, in that quarterly economic report I spoke of a moment ago, um, it's planning to go on at least six months into fiscal year 21, which fiscal year 21 begins in July. So that means the first six months it'll go through December. Um, you know, we're, we're always um, quick a, as a country and as a state to respond to um, recessionary trends and we're always slower to recover. So um, as you know, the governor's already doing some easing. So some things are, are gonna open up a little bit to help, but that's gonna be a slow and steady, uh, responsible approach we're hoping. Um, and and just to, to, end, to end with the biggest negative is, it wouldn't surprise me a bit as an FY21, there are other budget reductions that are required. Um, it's, it's too late. Um, even with a special session to to come up with additional new funds. Uh, so we're just predicting something that um, that is possible to happen, maybe likely, and and we want everybody to be prepared, but of course not not in a panic stage because um, if we're looking at the magnitude of the current reduction, it's it's definitely not um, a, a massive amount as we've done in the past. Robin or. Chair Young, if we have questions. Yes, I thank you, Charlie and Robin. We have um, about 12 more minutes. So uh, board members, if you'd like to start with any questions that you have regarding the budget, um, and then any other questions that perhaps linger. And then Tony and I are gonna lift our spirits back up. She's got some senior photos to share. As we end the meeting, we are not gonna end on Charles Harmon's forecast. So uh, we just won't let it happen. So any questions, feel free to unmute and I'll watch the time. Um, do it, jump right in, please. Uh, this is Lee. Um, Chair Young, I'd like to make a comment, but okay. it's not concerning budget. So if there are any questions. That okay. Patrice, let me cue you up for that then, Lee. Was yours a finance question? I was wondering if there's any belief that the federal government's going to do a fourth uh, distribution. I know that uh, Governor Como in New York has said that they haven't given any money to the states to help offset some of the expenses the states are having to endure. Is it, I don't know what the 
prospect of that is, but uh, I haven't heard as much about it. I've heard negative things about it come from the administration, but don't know what you all know. Um, we are hearing some conversation about it. Um, I think it's still too early to tell. I think lots of states, as we see the magnitude of the impact of um, revenues decreasing so dramatically from what was anticipated, and it being nationwide, it's not just one state that's going to feel this impact. Um, I think there is a strong push and a strong need for um, that to help with state efforts. And of course, that would benefit locals as well. So I think we'll just um, try to be cautiously optimistic. Uh, so we're like planning for the for the worst right now and hoping for the best. Um, but we sincerely hope that there will be some type of uh, additional relief. You know, the, the money that's being provided right now for our local school districts is really um, emergency relief. It's not stimulus relief. It's it's like to get us through this crisis. So but but we see evidence already across the state that there's going to there's going to need to be more than that if we're going to function anywhere remotely um, on a continuation of services to the general public. Lately, I want to answer, we are putting uh, as much energy as possible, uh, and you know what I mean here, to our uh, legislative officials, uh, simply because, I mean, higher education is really, as you know, I mean, we're, we're I don't even know how, it's going to be tough, and we don't have anything holding us harmless, uh, in other words. So this, we are pushing hard, my friend, for that to happen, and that's, that's the direction we think we have to put our efforts into now. I totally agree. Okay. Thank you. Any other budget questions before I open for Patrice? I just wanted to, Lou, if I can make a comment um, to reinforce what Robin and Charlie said. Uh, we always obviously, and, and this has been the case with every commissioner I've served under, I can remember when we had to do budget reductions, and I think every commissioner I've served under had to do some type of budget reduction uh, since at least uh, you know, on into probably 2007 and eight when that started. Um, always try to go for savings or uh, make up that deficiency through uh, cuts that don't directly impact school districts. But when you start looking at the, what is it, less than 1% that KD has for administrative purposes out of the total K-12 budget, uh, you don't get very far. Um, we were able to get there in this initial 1% reduction uh, by not affecting school districts for the most part in a big way. But we're down to the bone at the department. When you see the graph, and I've seen an early version of it about uh, staffing levels at the department, uh, it, you, you can predict it's a downward slope. Um, there's a few points going up, but they go back down. And um, the new commissioner is going to inherit a department full of uh, the people that are left, because when you look at the number we used to have to do these functions and these mandates, uh, very talented people. But um, as an example, and I want to give you, when, when CARA was uh, created and the intent uh, behind CARA was that the department would be able to bring in uh, some of the best and brightest throughout the uh, school districts to come to the department, even for a temporary time, and that would be a bump in pay for them, and they could go back or they could stay at the department. Well, that has now flip-flopped. We can no longer attract... Uh, the best and brightest from school districts in many cases because there that, that's a pay cut now coming to the department and that's that's because uh, we've not been able to keep up with the uh, market salaries that school districts are able to pay for these professionals and others that's just one small example so um, this time we were able to do it uh, without major effects on school districts but that three million will have a major effect on the department's ability because a lot of that's through vacancy credits and so those are people that we needed to hire to perform functions we continue to have funding issues with ksb and d we uh, have for the last about 10 years we take from other pots of money at the department to pay the light bill at ksb and d and uh, that's not sustainable 
And so there, there are issues that we're getting to um, that are as a result of this uh, every just continual cuts and uh, that we can no longer, we certainly can no longer uh, provide the level of service that we've been able to provide as this moves forward. Uh, we're basically running on adrenaline and fumes. And having said that, I also want, want, to, uh, want to send out to my fellow leaders of other state agencies, we have fared better than other many other, if not all other state agencies. Um, so having, so that's um, something to, to put that in perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And Patrice, thanks so much for your patience. Not a problem. This The budget is critical and I understand that. But before we left, I wanted to have the opportunity to jump back into a previous conversation uh, before we stepped in to the budget. Um, I too want to say, Commissioner Brown, thank you for your strength and your intelligence and as much as anything else, your empathy throughout this process. It's been amazing and we are fortunate to have you in that position at this time and to have your team in place. Um, everyone is doing a phenomenal job. Thank you, Tony, for the celebrations and yet keeping us informed been amazing to be able to sit in on many of the webcasts and uh, meetings that are taking place. Um, thank you for keeping us all aware of those. Um, teachers, food services, individuals, you have risen to a Herculean effort in completing what you need to do. Um, you've risen to the challenge. I've said over and over, you all are building the plane as you fly it, and you've done a phenomenal job. At the same time, I don't want to leave off a very important group of people, um, our parents. Our parents have stepped in, and they have become an absolute pillar um, in their child's education more than ever before. So my request at this point in time is as we step into additional plans for the NTI process, I would love to recommend that our school districts involve our parents in the planning process because they certainly have a new perspective of what life is like in this NTI process. And I would love to see a broad sp spectrum of parents involved in this process. Um, not just the ones who have a parent at home who can be supportive, but those working parents, um, perhaps those parents who have struggled with the internet uh, acquisition that they need for their children. I would love to see those representatives on the NTI process planning as we move forward. So thank you for giving me that opportunity to share that. And thank you for all you're doing. Patrice, we are gonna make sure that you always have the uplifting last word because you are the kind kindergarten teacher that everybody wants for their child. So thank you so much for taking us to that note. I think Tony is gonna share some of these photos and uh, Kevin and the team, thank you so much for today and Kentucky Board of Education. We have come a long way with virtual meetings since March. You guys are rocking it. Great job today with that. And Tony, to have the last Oh, I don't know about the, I don't know if I should have the last word, but I wanted to just share with you, just because our districts have shared so many photos with us, I just wanted to scroll through um, these, these pictures. I'm going to share my screen with you. These are um, 2,000 pictures that have been uploaded into my Google Drive from our high schools. So as we end today, I just wanted to show you, uh, there's no music yet, but uh, just to share with you, um, let me know when you see them. Can you see the screen yet? We've got the the gallery view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of just kind of scroll through uh, so you can see the gallery. I think this kind of shows. I asked them to send pictures of just the faces and what represents your schools, and I think this really shows and captures the true spirit of, of being a senior. You have athletes. You have uh, play productions. You have students in class. You have a couple, this one here I know in particular is from Jefferson County High School where they've already had um, kids that have graduated um, already and they've been handing out diplomas all year long. 
um, just so many pictures of success and excitement that a lot of these seniors have already been had part of uh, this year and that they continue to to do even though they're they're social distancing. So I just wanted to share these with you as we close out. And again, um, I'm going to be getting on a, on a conference call here with the CCSSO uh, about a national um, recognition program that we are going to be using to submit these photos to um, for a program that's going to have some national celebrities involved, as well as the, uh, the program that we're going to be doing uh, locally or statewide to honor um, our seniors. All right. As they graduate this year. Keep, keep showing those, Tony. I'm sure everybody in the back of their mind is humming pump and circumstance right now. <laughs> so we'll take a look at those. And um, unless anybody else has anything, I'll be open for a motion uh, to adjourn. Dr. Young, Alvis Johnson. Yes, Alvis, please. Question for Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Brown, uh, do you, we, do you, can we get... The gym campus closures for everybody. Do you see that being converted to an order? Uh, I know there are, there are literally hundreds and thousands of young men, athletes in particular, who are going to prepare for their season. So can you give me some insight into the, the gym campus closure? Is there is there uh, any uh, uh, timeline that we might uh, give out to our students that they can follow? Yes, I think, and just for the audience, I think you were breaking up a little bit. The question is whether or not, what, what's the timeline? We've issued a uh, recommendation and for at least the public schools and districts that their campuses are to be closed uh, to uh, to, for use uh, by students uh, through June 30. Uh, the private schools are also following that to a large degree directive and of course the public health orders dovetail in with that. We're in continued conversation with KHSAA as well as public health as to what that looks like past um, Ju or beginning July 1st to the extent that the easing of the restrictions would permit uh, students or at least individuals back on campus to utilize uh, facilities, maybe training facilities, uh, assuming that activity is also permitted under the KHSAA rules on an individual or small group basis. Uh, but you are correct that the uh, as of right now, Unless uh, things are eased, the public school campuses are closed until June 30th for at least congregate, congregate or group uh, activities. All right. Thank you. And Tony, I think we will have to stop the pictures for the roll call vote on um, adjournment. Do we have um, a motion to adjourn? I make a motion. This is Holly Bloodworth to adjourn. We have a motion and a second. Patrice McCrary. I and said. From Patrice. Um, and uh, as Chair Karam used to tell, Chair Karam used to tell us, we don't have to have any discussion on adjournment. So Jennifer, if you would please call the roll. Absolutely. Joanne Adams. Joanne Adams. Thanks everyone, and especially thanks to Chairperson Young. You did a great job, <laughs> and my vote is yes. Claire Bat. Claire Bat, and please stay safe, everyone. And my vote is yes. Thank you. Holly Bloodworth. This is Holly Bloodworth, and I vote yes. Alvis Johnson. This is Alvis Johnson. I vote yes, and would like to extend my compliments to the governor for the way he's handled uh, this current uh, situation. He's done just a tremendous job. Patrice McCrary. Patrice McCrary.
Thank you, Chair Young. You did a phenomenal job. And thank you, Jennifer, for keeping us on track. And I say yes. Cody Polly Johnson. This is Cody Polly Johnson. Um, it's good to see everyone, and I vote yes. Sharon Porter Robinson. This is Sharon Robinson. I vote yes. Lee Todd. Uh, this is Lee Todd, and I also vote yes. And Lou Young. This is Lou Young, and I vote yes, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.